Okay, good morning, everybody from India. Um, with the issues of time zones, unfortunately, I think our friends from Europe will not be able to join this early because for them it's about 6.37 a.m. But I'm hoping that we have a lot more participation from India. I think that everybody is joining in, uh, um, you know, by and by. But thank you so much uh, for being with us. This is today's day two of this fascinating conference. Uh, this was initiated two weeks ago. We had three speakers who came from different perspectives on design. Uh, Massimo Leone was the keynote speaker who spoke on filters and filters in the social media uh, on sign and design and a phen phenomenology of, of filters. So where he talked about demystifying, de-signifying in a world of complexities, he presented before us the challenge of the rhetoric of simplification that are offered to us every day. And how do we cope with this plethora of signs? In the midst of dialectics between signification and designification is the word filter to encourage a conversation between semioticians and designers. Filters, he said, is a semiotic apparatus. Design as codified procedures has to deal with a lot more today. For both semiotics and design, a new field opens up of transformations, of modifications. Filters alter digital images to increase their likability. The word filter comes from a Germanic root that creates a separation and a distinction. The word filter with a PH is etymologically about unification. Postmodern filtrum, as Massimo said, is cast around images. And he filter should be studied in the field of design than in the applied arts because of its industrial quality. Filters are a function of conformity and pre-coded applications. From there to Dario's fabulous uh, presentation on music uh, production as a design activity, which I will go into uh, probably la uh, later in the day. Um, today, we, on the 21st of April, we have a Papa packed panel of speakers. We begin with my good friend and mentor, Farooq Saif. Farooq is a professor emeritus, Antioch University, Seattle, and former president executive director of the Semiotic Society of America, a fellow of the International Communicology Institute, a registered architect, and an artist. Saif serves as the editor of the Semiotic Society of America, Semiotics. Prior to becoming an American citizen, Saif was born and raised in Egypt with a Coptic background. His main interests are design, semiotics, paradoxes, transdisciplinarity, and transmodernity. He has taught in universities and lectured at conferences worldwide. He was the recipient of the 2010 Fulbright Specialist Program at University of Sofia, Bulgaria. He has authored numerous articles and a dozen book chapters. His most recent publications are Design Agency, design agency as the envoy of intentionality, trajectories towards cultural sensitivity and environmental sensitivity, biosemiotics, design as a destiny of negation, the paradox of sustaining boundaries while traversing borders, the American Journal of Semiotics, the role of pragmatism in design, persevering through paradoxes of design and semiotics, cognito, journal of philosophy. His book, Design in the Transmodern World, Peter Lang, is a state of the art integration of design and semiotics. Farooq will speak on the inseparability of design and semiotics. Farooq, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you very much, Seema. And I want to also thank you and Salim for putting together this wonderful conference. It is really great to see colleagues and friends from all over the world. So thanks again, Seema, keep the good work. <laughs> I am going to share my screen here. Uh, so. Let me know if it is coming through. Yes, it is. 
Okay, is it clear to everyone? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep myself awake. <laughs> it's almost 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, past my bedtime. But anyway, I think the coffee is working very well. Uh, the topic of my keynote address here is inseparability of design and semiotics, design inquiry in education and practice. And when I emphasize design, I mean design hyphenated. So I have about five uh, topics to, to actually cover. Uh, the first one is inseparability uh, of uh, design, traditional design and semiotics, and two, intentionality and design, and three, navigating through design process, and four, design inquiry in education and practice. I will conclude by uh, number five, which is design as a destiny, destiny of negation. I'll explain all that later. So let me start first by how are design and semiotics interrelated? Well, design and semiotics are linked through the concept of intentionality. The mutual relationship between intentionality and semiotics has been articulated very well by John Dealey in 2007 in his book, Intentionality and Semiotics. And the intimate connection between the nature of intentionality and the idea of design has long been established by many scholars. So nothing really know about that. Intentionality means to signify, to seek meaning and significance. Design and semiotics are attached in an umbilical cord-like relation of intentionality, meaning making relies on that intentionality. As we shall see later, intentionality is not a journey or it's not a, it's, it's a journey and not a destination as most people believe. Now, So let me expand a little bit or how design and semiotics interrelated. Design thinking, design thinking in a traditional sense is extremely difficult to conduct by purely internal process without sign representations and interpretation. That is to understand the reality is signs. And to recreate reality, we must use, rely on design. Any question? Are we okay? So, so let me ask the big question here. What do we mean by design, design as hyphenated? Well, the notion of design is going to introduce the fusion of design, the third culture, as we call it, between sciences and humanities, and semiotics as the new branch, according to John Law. But there is a misunderstanding of the meaning of the prefix D in design. In English language, the primary function of the prefix D means to do the opposite of something or undo something. But in French, Spanish, and Portuguese, the prefix D indicates a shared place of organ or origins. In fact, the words design, design and signs are intimately connected design in Latin word also make, make sense that as to mark out, to devise, to choose, to make sign or signal. It seemed reasonable then to infuse design and semiotics into transdiscipl a transdisciplinary perspective or framework, if you would, 
that could best call design hyphenated. So why I choose the word design? Well, to say something new, we have to either use new words or to use words in new ways. So why design? Why design? Design and semiotics have been unjustifiably shoved back and forth between the two familiar domains of humanity and sciences, which have been two dominant cultures for more than 500 years. After the Renaissance era, arts and sciences gradually became two autonomous cultures leading to fragmentation of knowledge. Designers have been protecting their turf of design as art. I know that very well when I studied architecture many years ago. And some mutations have been trying desperately to gain legitimacy by claiming semiotics as the science of science, which is really ironic because uh, we tended to forget what Thomas Sibiak said, that semiotics is really the doctrine of science, not the science of science. Because design and semiotic do not fit within either humanities or sciences, they are marginalized or even avoided. But beyond the widespread semiotic jargon and preconceived the view of design as merely making artifact or products, the notion of design can play a significant role as an inquiry in which many disciplines are intertwined and also as an activity in which everyone can co-imagine and co-create desirable future. So when we engage in design, we are playing with boundary, not within the situation. I, I'm, I'm going to be stressing the word, the difference between playing within and playing with. Playing within the boundary of a specific situation may achieve some results, but playing with the boundary of a situation results in a breakthrough knowledge that it changes our understanding of reality. So let me move on. And the main thing that I want to talk about it now is the whole idea of intentionality and design. There are a lot of misconception about intentionality, which I will do, do my best to clarify. There is a difference between what we perceive as del deliverable and outcomes. Reducing design to the domain of making physical things and artifacts seem to draw many people to the common mistake of viewing design as merely deliverable things. They are not. We are not focusing on deliverable things, but quality or outcome. Design, or I shall say design, goes beyond the popular, popular everyday language that arrests the scope of design in the cage of artifact, products, and making things. Design is not about just artifact and making things. Design outcomes are manifestation of qualities. Very important point here. Design deliverables contain qualities, but they are not qualities themselves. Qualities are shapeless, formless, and indescribable, like what uh, Robert Persick called in his book, uh, book Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Qualities cannot even be named, but must be felt, according to Chris, Christopher Alexander, who were a known architect in US and international years ago. Quality is the essence of physical things, not a thing as such. 
qualities are the invisible relations between matter and its substance, between physical things and their essences. Qualities are invisible, hidden inside physical things. They are manifested through multifacets. Ironically, I'm going to stop here for a second because uh, I discovered that the word uh, quality, essence, and and uh, and uh, uh, the word quality and and uh, like a diamond in in, in 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 Arabic language, diamond and uh, diamond is the precious stone that has multifaceted, but it's also the essence of things. Gauhar and Gauhara, the, the, the two words in Arabic. Qualities reside in the core of qualia, as is described by uh, Peirce, that must be distinguished from properties and shapes, shapes of things. Quality is not a thing to aim at, but something to navigate toward. So having said that, I want to make a distinction between what we call objects and things. To develop a deeper understanding of intentionality and design, and the difference between outcomes and deliverables, we should make a distinction between objects and things. Ironically, the English dictionary defines the words objects and things synonymously, but they are different. They, there is a distinction between what we call things and what we perceive as objects. An object is not necessarily a thing to aim at. This is very important. The, the difficulty of understanding the difference between objects and things orients humans to think of reality as only the world of physical things, a hard core reality. For instance, as John Dealey would say, the sign of a unicorn is not a physical thing, but a legendary object. But a sign of a dinosaur is an object in the mind and also could be a real thing to perceive if you were living in prehistoric times. The same thing happened with the two names, Hamlet and Napoleon. These are actual physical items where objects are mental concept of things. The irony is that the real thing is only recognizable as a result of being an object in the mind. It is often difficult to understand this relationship between objects and things. The difficulty forces many of us to think of reality, as I said, a mere physical things that need to be targeted in order to fix or maintain that which has been in existence. Things can be targeted by aiming at, but objects, can only be obtained by navigation through, navigating through. Let me take this a little bit further. Talking about intentionality, there is another issue here which is very critical for us. There is a difference between deliberate act and intentional act. The two terms intentional, intentionally and deliberately are sometimes used interchangeably However, I make a distinction between intentional and deliberate, deliberate, deliberate act or action. Intentional act is spontaneous and aims at a desirable outcome. Deliberate act is calculated action for obtaining a specific result. Navigating through design, the design process is not a deliverable, deliverable deliberate act, but an intentional nonlinear movement of design thinking that while unpredictable holds the promise of rewarding outcomes. Uh, I, 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 and a good example here about how some people can be confused between deliberate and intentional act. 
is what's happening in political arena. There are so many propaganda that's actually relying on deliberate action, not deliberate, not intentional action. Although problem solving strategies to social and individual challenges frequently arrive at a temporary solution to problems, they substitute different different and short-lived conditions that will sooner or later trigger crisis and despair. For instance, using technical fixes in attempting to solve wicked social, economical, economic and political problem is an approach we have repeatedly failed. Solving problems is sometimes is a necessary first step. Metaphorically speaking, it is like first aid to stop the bleeding, but it does not lead to a long-term healthy way of living. Occasionally, a problem-solving strategy is a good immediate reaction, but it is not an ultimate response. That's why people trying to fix problem, they actually involve in the deliberate act, not intentional act. The distinction between deliverables and outcomes, between an object and a thing, is significant in our understanding of the difference between aiming at a physical thing and navigating toward an object in the mind. Aiming at a known target or a thing is really following a specific direction, but navigating through unknown toward a desirable outcome or quality is nonlinear, reiterative process of feedback and feedback forward. Perhaps aiming at a particular target and following a specific direction is an appropriate and effective way in medical treatments and military tactics. But again, in dealing with social and cultural changes, aiming a strategy at a target or a thing are limited and even misleading. The design design process should not be viewed as the predetermined destination aiming at an um, expected result or a thing. This is very hard to swallow for a lot of people. Design is a navigational process toward the desired outcome or qualities, as I said. And qualities are not things to aim at, but to navigate toward Aiming at is a problem-solving strategy, but navigating through is a creative design process. This leads me to the topic number, subtopic number three, navigating through design, the design process. The design process begs some questions. For example, how does anyone tolerate intentional journey with no perceivable destination? Very scary, very confusing. More specifically, how do we engage in design navigation while not knowing the outcome? Design process is ongoing process of open-ended trajectories for meaning making. The design, design process is not mere sequential steps, as most people think, but that pathless journey of meaning making. There, is, there are steps, as you can see in the slide, in the design process, but those steps are not sequential. You can jump back and forth between. You can also feed, use feedback and feed forward. So navigating through the unknown toward that which is yet to come is a nonlinear reiterative process of feedback and feed forward. 
in design process, there are no separation or absolute boundaries between thinking and doing as a way of conceiving a possible action or developing further actions. Each step in the design process builds on the other steps, but in a re reiterative process of feedback and feed forward for adjustments. It does not matter whether we start doing and then thoughtfully reflect or reflect before doing. When we reflect in action, we engage in praxis without depending on categories of established theories and techniques and techniques within traditional disciplines. Reflection can be before, after, or during action. I repeat, reflections can be before, after, or during action. This is where Dewey, uh, experimentation, and Sean, reflection and action, together emphasize what press call pragmatism, where the purpose of thought is for action. We are obligated to in inquire about the purpose of any design situation so that we may justify our long course of reflection and action. Design process is not a very quick thing to do, and it's not easy to do. It's a very challenging process. But design process is far from easy, as I said. Since design process does not aim at a predetermined result or physical thing, it is very challenging. An intrinsic principle for design for the design process is our ability to tolerate ambiguity and persevere through paradoxes, thinking and doing despite all odds. In the design, in the design process, we experience chaos and order, doubt and belief despair and hope, but belief and hope are neither immediate sensation nor immediate knowledge. Belief and doubt are acts of free will, expressions of freedom. Every that comes into existence does so by freedom, according to Kierkegaard. Existentially, while belief, belief and doubt are the opposite of each other, and the relation between their contradictory forces cannot be seen. Nevertheless, they are continuum, a cynicism, as Peirce would say, uh, continuity. <clears throat> Therefore, the design process does not follow a predetermined path or action or preconceived thought Rather, it is it is purpose, its purpose to engage in an unfolding emergent process without assurance or guarantee of rewards. Very challenging. The design process requires a sense of wonder and understanding the connection between audacity and resilience. We are seduced by our desire for creation, enchanted by the spill of wonder and the muse. Design is really a pathless journey. We make the journey by navigation. There is no road map. There is no Google map, nothing like that. So I'll move to the, the subtopic fourth, design inquiry in education and practice. We can train in a, we can be trained in a specific discipline or trade to solve a specific problem or to do a certain job eff efficiently over and over again. But efficiency does not mean effectiveness. 
Efficiency does not mean effectiveness. A lot of confusion about that. Training may maintain the autonomy and survival of traditional disciplines and fields, but education can contribute to the transdisciplinarity of knowledge, which design inquiry in the core of it. We, we can be educated to think holistically, systemically, and imaginatively in encountering unexpected unexpected and complex challenges. Education is a lifelong learning process. So that make me move into the first item here in, in that category, design inquiry from Bidgaji to Undergaji. The classic understanding of Bidgaji is and focuses on teacher instruction. The term andragogy is a pra the practice of teaching adults, where a teacher is a facilitator or a coach, teaching adults to become independent thinkers and self-driven learners. That is the essential part of teaching a student to engage in design inquiry. Andragogy is much more than training. The infatuation with training may explain the difficulty of disciplines to communicate with or learn from each other. Of course, learning includes both education and training, but education is not mere training. The critical issue that I want to emphasize here that to, it is, Training is not only to rely on one or to view training in lieu of education. It's not like the same thing. Unlike the autonomous discipline, which rely mostly on systemic investigation of search and research and follow a defined process that are that is gradually uh, repeatable and result in a predictable products. Design utilizes systemic inquiry, which is holistic and integrative and can lead to unexpected outcome. The difference between systematic and systemic. So there is more to it. Design, design demands the wonder of uncommon sense. And we have to be very careful here I'm not saying that the lack of common sense, uncommon sense, where imagination resides and intentionality is recognized. Meritan uh, has said in the past, back in 1959, he goes as far as to say, common sense has a kind of natural or a spirit for perversity, for stupidity. I wouldn't go to that far, but what I'm really saying, common sense is not the same as uncommon sense. One of the most fascinating aspects of design is the paradoxical thinking goes against what is expected as common sense into unexpected uncommon sense. That is, Common sense is expected in solving problems, whereas uncommon sense is needed for design inquiry that goes far beyond search and research. And that lead me to making a, a split hair between the three search, research, and inquiry. Design inquiry is really beyond search and research. Let me explain. Actually, search and research and inquiry, and inquiry are not synonymous, as the dictionary will tell us. While the boundaries among the categories of search, research, and inquiry are transparent, each category is really different. The word search 
from early 14th century, derived from the Latin word circare, means to go about, to wander, to traverse. Search also implied the act of going in circle or traversing to find truth or reveal what is hidden. The word research, which first appeared in English language in around 15, means to seek out facts. Inquiry is different category. Etymologically, inquiry means to ask, to seek, to for a quest, for knowledge. Inquiry is at the heart of design. That's why I'm stressing design inquiry. Search and research methods are far removed from integrative daily life, as we have witnessed in many occasions. While sticking to research method allows one to remain an expert in one's discipline or field, the products from other disciplines reveal such an expert is not an expert at all. The expert researcher in a specific discipline frequently plays within the boundary of that discipline. Whereas the design inquiry, inquirer constantly plays with the boundary of various disciplines. Again, the operative word, words here, playing with and playing within. Often the right or true answer is the outcome of traditional search and research. But even though that answer may work well for the natural world and technology, it is extremely limiting in designing social cultural transformation. It's like what we say, if all what you have is a hammer in your hand, everything is gonna look like a nail. Research and search have their place, but not enough in designing social cultural transformation. We can, therefore, we can categorize search, research, and inquiry in a way to appreciate their differences. I'm going to use metaphors here to help. We may assign metaphorical expressions of a springboard, empty chair, and symphony composition to these concepts, respectively. Search, for the most part, is a concept attainment process. Metaphorically, search as a concept attainment is a springboard that leads to finding a bridge that connect to further steps of exploration, a way to find or to discover something new about the present. Research is, a primary, is primarily a concept recall process. Research as concept recall is characterized by the metaphor of an empty chair, a sense of wonder which seeks an answer to the quandary of why a chair is empty. There must be an entity to be found or recalled that once occupied that chair. Research is a way of understanding the past and the present. Design inquiry, therefore, depends on concept formation and demand imaginative and integrative skills. For example, apply it for the metaphor of the symphony composition. I'm using these metaphors just to help us to make a distinction between the three categories, search and uh, search research. But in fact, design inquiry is actually embody and include both. Design inquiry includes search and research. But once again, we cannot just use search or research in design. Now I move to the final uh, section here, which design as a destiny, destiny of negation. 
since we cannot see or uh, or know for certain the outcome of our navigation, we surrender to the joy of creating without knowing, or we shall say, consciously not knowing. I want to make an important point here. There is three different categories. There is unconscious not knowing, which is a form of ignorance, or consciously knowing, which is a form of arrogance. So it's not ignorance or arrogance, but sustaining our knowing in order to know much more. What I mean by surrendering, surrendering is cultivating comfortable attitude toward consciously not knowing and being surprised by unexpected outcomes of playfulness. Design navigation is at the heart of Peirce's pure play of amusement. Such free play is a moderate indulgence that, according to Peirce, has no purpose on this recreation. The play of amusement relates not only to our playful dis disposition toward the making artifacts, but also to our urge to recreate reality by inciting us to play with conventional boundaries and to traverse socially, socially enforce or self-imposed borders. The relationship between intentionality and playfulness is paradoxical. Intentionality is a spontaneous act that makes it possible for us to make meaning of our world. It's really interesting, I recall now, how when we were children, younger children, we can actually create and imagine things and have playful attitude toward it. We have forgotten that as we became adults. Playfulness is a moderate indulgence that acts as a source of amusement and recreation as we navigate toward meaning making. Both intentionality and playfulness must assess through reflection in action and experimentation, as I indicated earlier in the design process. To grasp intentionality and playfulness is to achieve meaningful fulfillment through design where the inter, in, indeterminacy of design outcomes involve multiple options and infinite possibility for creating a desired future. So there is a, the notion here about immateriality of intentionality and indeterminacy of outcome, very difficult concept to understand or even to practice. Design intention is not a goal-directed activity, nor is it linear thinking aimed at specific target, as I said earlier, which would imply direct control over the process and it is a result. That particular way of thinking always generates what Gregory Bateson calls Tele a tele teleological fallacy, teleological fallacy. The concept of design has unlimited creative options and imaginative possibilities. Through design intention, we can reframe the habit of the past and the contingency of the present, thereby we have the potential of navigating through design toward a desire So that leads me to the next item here, which is the, the, uh, the argument over free will or determinism. But uh, I go back to Peirce's uh, help here. Uh, Peirce's phenomenological categories are very helpful. Firstness is the reality of the, of, of the possible, 
what could be, as we call it, I call it, that which is yet to become. Sacredness is the reality of existence, the heart existing reality, which I, I would call that which already exists. Thirdness, according to Peirce, is the reality of habits that mediates between what exists and what could be. According to Peirce, it is never possible to first of reality that not that is not occupied the, the fact that what exists and what is uh, the possible, there is always the thirdness which mediate between the two. According to, to Peirce, again, that's thirdness that mediate between the firstness and secondness. In design, we experience close encounters with the unknown, not only through external deterministic forces, but also by our own volition, willingly and unwillingly, our desire and choice. Since nothing in reality is a static fact or an absolute certainty, certainty, it is possible for human beings to have the free will to navigate through space-free and time-free reality. Sometimes I call diaphanous space and polychronic time to conceptualize and materialize that which we desire outcome. Challenging issue here is that paradoxes can never be solved or resolved. And, and the unexpected emergent outcomes are really quality that are, as I said earlier, shapeless and formless. The only way to deal with these paradoxes is to persevere through them, not to try to solve them as problem. So navigating toward unknown reality, which I'm relying here or borrowing a concept from Joseph Campbell, uh, wrote a book in, in back in 1949, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it's the hero journey. And using that metaphor or that uh, model to relate to design. Design as a destiny of a negation necessitates the courage to tolerate ambiguity and the uncertainty of navigation toward that which is yet to become. That requires us to persevere through the paradox of being in the world and withdrawing from the world. How could we be in the world and withdraw from the world? Another paradox. But Heidegger reminds us that the word dasen, which literally means being there, is an indication of not just being in the world, but also being present in the past, present, future dimension. We have forgotten that. We have the capacity to do that through what I call future memory. And briefly, past memory related to something that I have experienced before. Future memory is something that I have never experienced before, something imaginable. So if it, we talk about imagination here, there is the big question. <laughs> If uh, design, uh, how how we do, how we assess the integrity of our imagination, because in fact design design can be good and bad. I will never forget this. Many years ago, I had uh, graduate students, and one of them said, "Well, wait a minute. Is Hitler? Would you consider Hitler a good designer or a designer?" And I said, "Yeah, Hitler was a designer, but not a good designer." that has lack sense of integrity. Well, this is very difficult concept about integrity and imagination. How do we assess our design thoughts and action? I leave you with an insight from ancient Egypt. 
which I still have big part of my life and in my heart. The goddess maths of ancient Egypt represent truth, order, justice, ethics, morality, etc. As according to Egyptologists who struggle with the name, with the meaning of math, no single word can describe the nature of math. However, we may perceive it as a sense of integrity and process. It can do anything that actually can hurt or be destructive for others. For ancient Egyptians believe in the intelligence of the heart. They weigh the heart of the disease against the feather. And this imaginal intelligence, which reside, resides in the heart, ancient Egyptians believe intelligence is residing in the heart, not in the brain. Integrity of imagination is ethical wholeness. It presupposes its discretion and a sense of appropriateness by which we modify our words and action in response to a changing situation throughout time. It is through design that we can navigate our pathless journey from the mundane experience to the external ordinary life world of making meaning. Thank you very much. Farooq, that was brilliant, um, deeply philosophical as always. And um, it, it, it took me back to, uh, you know, listening to you face to face. I'm completely mesmerized by your rendition. And I think um, it's going to take me uh, a bit of time to, to but, but it was absolutely, thank you so much. What a, what a fantastic uh, beginning to the day. Um, Anybody, uh, I would, I'd like to leave the floor open for anybody who'd like to uh, ask Farooq uh, any question, any thoughts, uh, anything that you think has made, uh, resonated with your uh, ideas of design, please uh, feel free to, um, Salim, uh, uh, Salim, uh, would you like to just come on camera because uh, I think Farooq would like to also thank you. Uh, you were not here in the morning. So, Salim, can you? Yeah, Salim, hi. Hi. So, hi. Farooq. Hello, Salim. Hi, 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 Farooq. Hi. It was incredible to hear, Farooq. Amazing. Um, the levels and the navigation of a design process uh, from this angle, it's incredible to, uh, to engage it and, and to hear this level of discourse. Um, yeah, I absolutely enjoyed it. I, I missed uh, the beginning, but I joined at some point and I was uh, uh, mesmerized by um, the theories and the aspects of uh, how you spoke about navigating design process. Um, uh, incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uday, would you like to... Uh, yeah, Uday. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a really wonderful talk and it actually sorted out a lot of confusion that I have in my mind. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you. I, uh, to, uh, one take home for me is it's not the fear of searching for uh, or researching for something, but it's a joy of searching for unpredictable that seems to matter a lot in design process this thought was never clear to me but when i heard you it became somewhat uh, you know obvious that that's what should be the way to describe design process so thank you for putting this into a place thank you well uh, there, there is add, sorry there add over even the idea of inquiry versus you know search and research um it's very special to hear this uh uh, the way this is constructed, even the argument and the understanding of what uh, design actually is. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Well, the, the thing that I want to emphasize that sometimes words have certain meaning to all of us. And the way we use words determine the way we think. And the way we think determine the way we act. It's really incredible. I mean, we take things for granted, not, not we here, but in general. It's amazing that there is a big difference. The dictionary, the English dictionary is almost like, oh my God, It. wait a minute. Have you ever even tried to look at the word whole, W-H-O-L-E, in the dictionary? And, and the dictionary would say, whole is separated, is autonomous. It's, a, it's a, well, There is no whole that's being separated. If it is separated whole, it's a dead whole. It has to be part of a larger whole. I don't exist without you. I don't exist without my family. So whole is part of a larger whole. I'm using this as an example, how tedious and tyranny the words can be in one language. What really help us all, if we know other languages, it makes the connection say, oh my God, it's not what the English dictionary say. So the word search and research and inquiry have been using interchangeably but they are quite different. Now, very thing, what, I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize here, by having the differences is not that I'm dismissing any one of them. Design inquiry integrate both search and research, but not relying on one of them. Big difference, big difference. And this is how has a lot to do with why uh, we designers and we as semioticians have really a challenge trying to communicate with the world because we use words that don't necessarily have meaning to other people. Yeah, Audi, I think you want to say something. Would I? Yeah, no, I, I am fully convinced about it. Uh, this problem of words. When you're talking, I the first word that came to my mind was abductive thinking. Abductive thinking is abductive thinking. Yeah. yeah. You put it at a very different level. No, I mean, it's such a dry word that abductive thinking. But the way you this is... the way you described, you put it at a, on a pedestal, which is good. Thank you. Well, th thank you for reminding me about Perse's inductive, uh, inductive, deductive, and abductive. Yeah. You see, the whole idea about abductive, as we know, is really falling in love. It's just, it is really the desire to do something that we love. Design inquiry is about desire, the love and desire, not desperate. Problem solving is wonderful, but not enough. Design and desire are really intimately connected through the word desirata. Yeah, abductive abduction is part of that. So, in fact, search and research rely on inductive deductive. As we learn, you remember when we were kids and we were learning scientific method inductive deductive until we got person say, oh, there is a third level here. It's called abduction. Good point. Thank you. That's, I should okay. include. Yeah. So, uh, so I, and uh, being, uh, uh, you know, from the linguistics uh, uh, background myself, I absolutely loved the use of words like tasmeen. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know, and, and it's so relevant to design because uh, we don't even think of perseverance as an important aspect of the design process. Yeah. Thank so. you, Seema. That's, uh, thank you for reminding. I didn't say much about that. I was trying to watch the time, really. I have a lot to cover. You can, you can continue to say what you want right now. Yeah. I would, be such happy. A beautiful I would be word. happy. You know, our students actually are really wonderful, wonderful triggers for a lot of thinking. I will never forget one time many years ago, and one of the students said to me, you know, you keep saying design, design. 
I, I'm not sure that I want to, I want to hear different word. And boy, I didn't know what to do, except to going back to where I learned the language. In Arabic language, the word tasmeem, which is on the slide, it is. It can be used as design or perseverance. So it depends on the sentence. If you use tasmeem in a sentence that relate to the, to design, this design. If you use it as persevering through uh, paradoxes, that's another way to look at it. And that give me idea about. In fact, there is a word for design, but not an English word. <laughs> We call it tasmeem. There is no design with perseverance. It's the nature of life. It's the nature of life. And we, one cannot really design without persevering through paradoxes. Design really is about persevering through paradoxes. You have control and surrender. You move through the process without knowing the outcome. I mean, among many things. Oh, this is another thing that's really I, I fail to mention. It's fascinating what people, again, going to the English dictionary. The word convergence is actually very confusing. Convergence does not mean that I'm coming to one point. So people make a distinction between divergence and convergence and design paradoxically relate to both. Bear with me. So in fact, convergence is not about bringing something. I mean, it's not about focusing, focusing on something, rather bringing things into focus. Ah, my God, big difference. Metaphorically speaking, I can hold the magnifying glass and create rays and create even fire to one point, right? Versus the other option wearing glasses that I can see 300 degrees with clarity. Convergence is not focusing on, but bringing things into focus. That's really the nature of design versus problem solving. Problem solving, you focus and you hit, like military operation or medical treatment. But design is not the same. It's not the same as problem solving. And this is amazing, uh, Farooq, amazing to uh, hear because we so commonly speak about design as a problem sol solving process. and. Uh, uh, I always uh, felt otherwise. I didn't feel it was inclusive enough uh, for a design uh, activity. But this also, uh, you know, this, what you're saying is uh, absolutely relevant to expanding yeah. uh, the understand of the design uh, process and the design and, and the act of design rather. Well, you reminded me, Salim, about back in time about architecture, and we used to call. Uh, problem design, problem solving design, or something like that. It's an oxymoron. If you have a problem, you don't design. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> when we design, we create problems and we solve it. But when someone dumps a problem on us, that's problem solving, and we get trapped, and we becoming yeah. becoming almost enslaved by playing within the boundary that already established. I, there is something else that's actually Salim reminded me about by talking here. In design, when you have a challenge, not a problem, we reframe the challenge, not filter the challenge. Filtering is actually having the same entity being purified, but it's still the same thing. Reframing is actually completely changing the whole structure of the entity. It's, uh, it's very interesting. It's like if I draw a circle on a piece of paper and show you what is this, and you say, well, it's a circle. It's a representation of a piece of, of a loaf of bread, a moon. 
but not many people will actually see that as a whole in the space, not an object. If we rely on modifying and filtering a situation, we still playing within the boundary of that situation. Make it clear or pure does not make it different. That's the difference that make the difference as, um, uh, as Bateson would call it. Reframing or strategy, look at a problem or a challenge and frame it differently, completely differently. So that alter the structure and the meaning that we perceive in that entity, not just filtering. This is, can be used in technology, but that's not in my design vocabulary. Fabulous, Farooq. Um, Kaumudi, would you like to ask? I think you've raised your hand. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to. Yes, hi. 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 Uh, thank you, Professor Sheikh. That was really an interesting talk. In fact, uh, it's nice to hear how the whole design field can be reframed from the point of view of uh, both predictability and unpredictability. Uh, I'm a designer and what intrigues me about what you said is uh, there is a predictable world, which you also described from the point of view of habits some time back. And you were also speaking about unpredictability. And that's where I guess the whole issue of uh, a paradox comes in. Uh, but in a predictable world, where I say that uh, we have a predictable materiality with us in the sense that I'm able to communicate with you right now, which means that the meaning of the word is communicable and in that sense predictable. If I look at predictability in the, from the point of view of what I'm able to communicate to you, everything around me to an extent, if the language is the same as yours and mine, is predictable. And yet from the point of view of design, all the time, what we are trying to negotiate in this predictable world is to bring in unpredictability. So I was just wondering that what really makes the relationship which is predictable and then leads on to unpredictability. Of course, it's what Professor Atwinkar said, it will be abductive, right? But even between the abductive nature of the thinking, it seems like what you just use is a word oxymoron, that from a predictable world, we're all wanting to get into an unpredictable scene. So semiotics or its understanding in design comes in with the whole, uh, I wouldn't say limitation, but the boundary within which you can actually make meanings and not just make meaning, but also be able to bring in new meaning. But at the same time, all of us know that we can't invent a meaning. Over. Yeah, 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 yeah. V very well said. And meaning is not individual created meaning. Meaning is co-created, that's one thing. The other thing that I'm getting from what you're saying, because the unpredictable world, problem, some people see that as a problem trying to fix what is like economist. I'm, I'm, I don't wanna get myself into trouble here. The last thing that I believe in is economy. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stick my head here. But it, it's not just one thing. It's, it is not, it's like what I was saying, it's not focusing on one thing, but bring things into focus, bring clarity to the situation, which is more inclusive. Um, but what, we, what you're saying, it's also triggered something in my mind about political system and social and economical system. People, I'm sorry, People who are in leadership position uh, politically and economically, they control us through the unpredictable thing. They take that in their advantage, even technology. It is, yes, there is unpredictable world, but that doesn't mean that I have to shove it in my mouth. I, have, I don't have to do that. Uh, and again, as I was saying, the creation of, of 
that which is yet to come, as I call it in my talk, it's not really one person. We don't have Renaissance man anymore. And we don't need the Renaissance man for God's sake, neither Renaissance woman. We need the, co the collective, what Piss call it, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, learners. It's not just one person marching in the front, but the collective, the collective, and I'm using the collective consciousness as Jung would use it, or the American First Nation, we call it the supreme being, et cetera, et cetera. That which transcend me. There is another thing, actually, remind when you talk, remind me of, there are a lot of stuff that I, did, I didn't have a chance to talk about. You see, <laughs> I looked back to the English dictionary, Odi. I looked for a word in the English dictionary or English language that actually represent the notion of whole and love. I couldn't find it. I made it up and I came up with the term holophilia. Holophilia is one word, the love of wholeness. I'm, re I'm saying that and I didn't get into that. There's a lot I cannot really talk about. I have, I have no time. Holophilia is very significant here and why? In design, holophilia a prerequisite for my action. And not only that, holophilia is the manifestation of my action. So holophilia, the love of wholeness, has it is a prerequisite and manifestation of my action in the world or my design. Uh, that's another thing which is I it's an actually expand on that on my book design in the transmodern world, envisioning reality beyond absoluteness. There is no absolute. Even God and goddess are not absolute. God is here. I'm talking to God and goddess. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is, I, I can go on and on. Design is really sharing the act of creation with the universe, with goddess and God if whatever you believe in. Yes, I was raised as a Coptic Christian, but I, my understanding of spirituality increased over the years and becoming more inclusive of things that I never thought about it before. Wow, Farouk, you have so much to share. There's so much to listen to you. It's just incredible. I wish I could, you know, sort of give you five hours, but given that you are now approaching your, thank you, Kamudi, for that lovely, wonderful question. Um, uh, so I think, Farooq, I think five to six hours is not enough for you. Um, you know, we, we will need almost an entire day with you or maybe two, but uh, if anybody else has any one last question, if anybody, otherwise, I think uh, we will sort of let Farooq uh, go and sleep because it's, it's what, 11 o'clock now for you? It's yeah. 11 p.m. Yes, yeah. and way yeah. past uh, what you would normally uh, retire uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I, I just, I'm, I'm so privileged to have you as my mentor, Farooq. And again, it, it was wonderful to hear you. Thank you so much for such a fascinating start to the day. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. And thank you for the good work. Thank you. Bringing all of us together. Yes, we, uh, so Salim uh, and I will, will try and get you all down to India, but you don't need a conference, Farooq. You're always welcome. Uh, any time, right? So, you know, the the offer is always open to you. We have some witnesses here, huh? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, we have quite a few witnesses, but like I said, you, you can hold me up for it. I'll yeah, thank honest. you, Farooq. Thank you. I think um, I don't, I wouldn't, I would insist that you stay on, but if you can, that would be wonderful because it would be nice if you could hear Uday. It really is how much you can. I leave actually, it to you. Actually, I, since I have my coffee here, and it's a good coffee. <laughs>
So I'm. Wonderfully wonderful. To our is a friend. Uh, courses at SEPT, and we've also known each other for more than. 15 years now we've met in the industry um we uh, i i have a lot of uh, regard and respect for uday and his contemporaries because in the post independence india uh, you know the industrial design uh, was what it was the the innovations that happened at that time period happened thanks to Uday's, um, Uday and his, his contemporaries. He is an industrial designer, an architect by, uh, by education, um, an industrial designer, and now more of a game designer. He taught at IIT Mumbai for almost three decades. He belongs to, uh, to like I said, a generation which we will always miss and we will always want uh, the younger generations to take over this kind of innovative work that they did in the 60s and the 70s. And today, Uday will speak on thrills of meaning. Uday, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Seema, for those words. Let's see whether I meet that requirement. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, is my screen visible now? Yes, Uday. Okay, so we can go ahead. Uh, I've deliberately chosen this title and as I go through, I will explain why the title is way, uh, the way it is framed. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, the first keynote address given by Massimo, where he talked about uh, Uh, he talked about, uh, he started with a story where he was running in uh, uh, Turin and he found himself surrounded by a lot of signs and sign boards. There was an enormous variety of typefaces, colors, etc. Uh, he was talking about how people are surrounded by signs and they have to make a meaning out of it and they have to figure out a way. What happens if he chooses to run in India? And that's a very different picture here. There are different languages, there are different layouts, uh, ideas, there are different choices of colors and enormous variety. Let me sort of show you what that variety is. This also is a streetscape in India. You can see every, every one sign is trying to shout for attention from others. There's a huge competition that is happening there. A little more organized version of that and a very organized version of this. And this is a single street which spreads over less than half a kilometer. And this is a variety that you get in that half kilometer. The point that I'm making is that we are surrounded by many complex things and you do have to make sense out of this. And if you want to live in this world. Uh, so designers do generate a wide range of uh, uh, science. We do it with good intentions, okay? But often it can also lead to a mess because everybody's good intention collectively may not make a good impact. Uh, semiotics has shown its way in how to handle some of these messages that come across. Uh, to me, the known uh, reference was what was happening in Ulm school in Germany, where they tried to use uh, analyze science using uh, 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 semiotics as a background. Uh, but like Farooq, I'm little uh, from a different area. I'm an architect. I create objects. I don't create signages. I don't create posters. I don't create representation, but I create objects. Interestingly, objects must also communicate. 
and they better communicate. Otherwise, there will be a confusion in the world. Just imagine if all objects that you come across are just cubes. You know, they're all shaped as cubes. It will be impossible to live in that world. It will be impossible to know what to do with these objects. So objects have to make sense. And making sense is what I'm going to speak about. So I have a two-part presentation. It depends on the amount of time that's available. And I would uh, let Seema decide that. Uh, we'll start with making so meaning. Take your time. To yeah. Take your time. Okay. Making meaning Absolutely. through objects. Okay, that's first part. And second part is a kind of new problem that I'm facing because now I'm designing games. And games pose a very different kind of a problem than you know, what objects uh, uh, that I encountered. This is just to give you an overall work that I've done housing. I've done housing for very, very poor people. In fact, the one that you see here, the interior of a house, it is a 10 feet, a three meter by three meter by three meter cube in which a family of four can stay. And these are the kind of challenges that uh, uh, Farooq might call them as problem solving challenges. So these are the kind of challenges that come, uh, one takes in uh, architecture. Uh, I also done furniture. This is a furniture that is done for puja, you know, where you can sit down without any practice. You can squat without any practice. I've also done small temples, I've done an ATM, I've done a monocular for visually challenged, and also recently a uh, lots of games and puzzles. This is just to give you an idea of these objects had to communicate and they had to send messages by which people can use them. Now, the question is, can semiotics contribute to meaning of uh, meaning, meaning making in design of objects? You know? This has been a classic question because it's, at least there is a school in semiotics that believes that objects are not part of science at all. The first paper on this came in 1984 by Klaus Krifendorf and Butter. They talked about uh, product semantics are exploring symbolic qualities of form. And this is where they talked about the, uh, how classical semiotic framework had to be flexed in order to accommodate objects. I don't want to get into that because uh, the work that uh, was done later is very different. Uh, but it had made some important contributions. The first important contribution that that paper made was that people started treating, uh, treating objects as messages and design as a communicator. Okay? So designer is also a communicator and he creates messages. Uh, it also made the phrase product semantics as a popular part of design discourse. And this was important because nobody had talked about product centrality. They coined the word during that paper and it became quite popular. But some found it hard to accept this manipulation of semiotic framework to accommodate objects. And I was also one of them. Uh, what designers need, and I'm going to take a very clear standpoint of a designer who is trying to understand meaning and trying to uh, sort of also create meaning. I've been studying how architects think and how they solve problems, done a lot of experiment and a lot of publications are in that area. And they have a very unique way and some of it Farooq really brought out very well. He talked about the fact that you're looking for unexpected and all that. And that's a very interesting area to study. Uh, what was really required in terms of meaning making as far as designers was concerned is, that people do encounter objects as messages, but product semantic does not, uh, idea is not compatible with the way things are driven in designer's mind. And I'm again coming back to the way Farooq used the word things. This is something which I'm also going to talk about a little later, that these things seem to drive designer's mind to create some interesting and uh, you know innovative ideas. But at the same time, designers need something like hands-on tools that internalize meaning making. You know? They cannot really be, uh, I mean, they, uh, they could be of course theories, but the theories have to be converted into tools so that they are able to control the meaning. Now, there is this problem about uh, controlling meaning and uh, you know designers creating meaning. I know that it is, and it is correct that 
meaning making is a co-creation. It's a it's a person who perceives who creates meaning. But I've deliberately taken a position saying that it's a designer who creates a meaning just for the sake of discussion because that's the way he could learn how to control meaning and how ultimately you know use it as part of his design process. So my focus is can meaning making be made as part of the design process? Uh, so it's some, something like a reaction to semiotics framework that existed, but I've been struggling with the question much before the word product semantics came. And I was looking for answers at that point because as a teacher, I always had a problem how to justify a student's work. And when he comes with some kind of you know, visual statement, how do you comment on it? I looked at a completely different source and that was cognitive psychology. And they seem to have addressed these problems very, very differently. And it's a very nice work. So let me kind of drift into the works by some of the eminent cognitive psychologists as well as philosophers. Okay. So first thing that I encountered was a work of Elnor Roche on categorization and taxonomy of natural objects. This was a 1970s paper. It created ripples at that time, and it was very popular. I came across it a little later, four years later in 1980. And it actually was had a lot of interesting insights. The key concept that uh, she presented or her team presented is, I mean, she was of course looking at object rec recognition as her uh, main area that as far as natural objects are concerned, it is the predictability due to correlations of sensory clues that makes people identify an object. She also made interesting comments about uh, basic objects, prototypes, etc. And that actually made me start thinking about it. What she talked about is that there are sensory clues in every natural object that lit and they are predictably there and that allows you recognition of that object. You can identify an object as a bird by merely looking at this little photograph. So you could probably see this word there, are, uh, I mean, uh, see the bird here. There's some clues, visual clues are more information rich than others and they are sufficient to disclose the identity one can call this as uh, denotation as far as semiotic framework is concerned, but that's exactly what they do. And she kind of attributed it to information rich clues. Uh, the clues can be sensory, so it doesn't have to be visual. It can be even auditory. For instance, in case of a bird, the bird call is as important as uh, the way he looks. So if you simplify her work, it would mean information rich clues plus correlation leads to predictability of the object that makes identification and categorization easy. That's a simpler way of looking at it. She also went deeper into three concepts that exist. And this is where things in the mind come in, the subordinate level, the basic level, and super, superordinate level. And I was able to use all of this to create some interesting tools which could allow designers to investigate the way you know, clues operate and disclose identity. I extended this work to man-made objects. I mean, the Ro Roche's work doesn't talk of man-made objects. Occasionally, she has made reference, but uh, not uh, that is not the focus. And created tools based on visual clues. Uh, what I found is that Roche's theory was very designer of designer friendly. You know, so for making meaning, it was kind of giving some kind of a uh, way of uh, entering into that area. So these are the clues. There's a photograph behind, and you know it's a kind of a finding giveaway clues. And each cell opens uh, randomly, and at some point you sort of indicate. That it's a computerized tool. Some point it indicates what the object is likely to be, and this is how it kind of discloses which clues have been more information rich than others. Uh, Obviously, the work took me to Wittgenstein's uh, theory on categorization. Again, he's talked about natural categories. And some of the concepts that influenced the work that I did was based on one, that representation of a category is by a prototypical example. So it's the this example which is used as a cognitive reference to compare all other examples in that category. 
and they are they create what is called as an asymmetry in the category or a graded membership. Let me explain you through an example. Okay. So his basic thing is there is a set, each category is structured around the central member, which is one of the most typical example of that particular category. And then, you know, every other member is compared. So this is probably for some cultures, this may be a typical dog. And then there'll be others and there'll be others which will come in. He also mentioned about a fuzzy boundary. And I'll come back to that a little later because that's very important for design. And it's also important for what Farooq said about be, being within the boundary and uh, you know trying to challenge the boundary. Now, what is the implication of creating such a map? The implication is simple because you can also understand objects like this. Every culture has a typical chair. And then there are a large number of other chairs which become atypical. And there are some chairs which are, are almost challenging the fuzzy, fuzzy boundary. The bin back chair is one of them, which has a very little chair look, but it is still a chair, but it challenges the boundary of chair and makes you shift that. I'll come to significance some up later because this is where the strategy comes into picture. Okay. So uh, he also mentioned that fuzzy boundaries are shiftable. And this is what designers love to challenge. You know, they would like to challenge the shifting boundary and shift the boundary so that the culture accepts their creation as something that can be called as a mainstream. And the last concept that influenced me was the idea of family resemblance. This was, of course, later on elaborated by uh, uh, George Lekoff, uh, the idea of family. Resemblance. But it's a very powerful idea of creating categories. Now. Could this theory be used to create some kind of a way of controlling the message? And that is where the idea of category map came and idea of control came in. And let me explain you through an example of how it is possible to move or along the along the entire asymmetric structure of the category in your creation. So it you, because the creation is not necessarily dictated by a designer's wish, but there is a business to be done. There is uh, you know. Uh, a company identity to be looked at. And these are the kind of issues that come in. So to me, a designer should be able to design very close to mainstream or very close to first boundary or fuzzy boundary or anywhere in between. And that's something which I put as an aim. So here is an example of someone's student work. Uh, this, this particular girl was looking at what do people consider as a typical earring? And it was interesting when it was put onto us, you know, we have a software which does that, you know, it gives you from typical to atypical and things like that. This was a result of that. Very typical had a very interesting characteristics of hanging and, you know, some kind of sound making in floating devices, which could uh, make that uh, sound. And as you go away to typical to less typical and atypical, the earrings change quite a lot. Now this is, and there's always an odd example that happens here. So what really is, what we're looking for is to know the typical, what is the earringness of an earring? And this software also allowed age, gender and professional differences. We thought that people will have a different opinion. Men will have a different opinion than uh, women, but it was surprising that in earrings, both of them seem to have talent, but not necessarily in all other projects. So what was really interesting is to know the typical. It doesn't mean that you necessarily design close to typical, but it is important to know the typical as well as the gradient, you know, the, how the gradient changes and new features come in or new clues come in. Now look at, I mentioned about the significance of this map. It's important for us to know as a designer, uh, you know, all of us want to change the world and we want to challenge the boundary, you know, so everybody would like to be somewhere close to this, sorry, somewhere close to this, but that is not always what is really challenging. It's very, very important to choose where you want to locate your project or product in order that you compete in the market. It's quite likely that the market is crowded, but you still want to introduce a new product very close to the mainstream and still make sense still make a difference. And that, according to me, is the biggest challenge. It's, it's relatively easy to be uh, avant-garde and create very different uh, kind of an expression. 
but these expressions may not really influence the culture and the typical the way it should. Of course, there are exceptions in this. For instance, uh, 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 the first iPhone did influence, uh, it was a fuzzy boundary kind of an example, but it has now become a mainstream. Uh, this is another example. We were looking at cigarette lighters and this is what the map looked like. You know, the most typical writer, uh, lighter at that time, and this was a long time back, and then less typical, less typical, and those which are beyond the boundary. You know? Now, this gives you a strategy of where do you want to enter. This student wanted it to be between one and two, and he created his own design of writer, which I'll show you. Okay. This was a, the one in the center is his design. He wanted it to go close to the typical. So he added some interesting visual clues from this to create a new product, which looked like this. You know? So it, the point that I'm making is, is it possible to create strategies by which a designer can comfortably move along the gradient and create innovative products totally wherever he wants to position his, his product. And that's the point that I was trying to make. So really, Designer's goal should be right, when when you, when you create an object as a message, it should be locating it on the gradient somewhere and predictably locating it so that it should actually come where it want he wants it to be, and finding an identity within that gradient uh, so that it becomes an exclusive product, but it is still close to mainstream or it is the middle or it's in the fuzzy boundary. So. The question is, how do you create a difference? And I'll show you an example of my own work. We did an office phone some years ago. It started with the way receiver should be, the way you sculpt the entire body of an office phone. And then this was the idea behind it. We started using some kind of a metaphoric links to create identity. For instance, this uses the identity of office phone-ness and a telephone directoriness, and it combines both of them to create an identity, but it's very close to the mainstream. Uh, this was loosely based on Lakoff's idea of generating metaphors. It's not exactly following what he has in mind. So finally, if you want to capture this in a sh short phrase, meaning making is as a ness of the object, you know, the churchness of a church, the chairness of a chair, and shoeness of a chair. Uh, shoeness of the shoe, and all of them are controllable by a degree. So what you really need to know is what is the ness of the object and how you can control it. And next, uh, ness also has a cultural roots, which I'll come to a little later. So within the structure of the category, one should be able to control the ness in a way by which you can position the product wherever you want to. And these maps and this tool give you a very designerly friendly way of controlling meaning. And it's also compatible with the way designers think and the way the industry thinks. Another work that influenced me was uh, designers, uh, uh, I mean, uh, William Lover's work, who is a social linguist, on the idea of typicality and culture. He had shown these examples to people and asked them to identify a typical cup, a typical bowl, and a typical vase. And this was the result. His typical was a cup was somewhere close to one and two here. And he mentioned that it's very culture specific. For instance, in India, the idea of cup may be very different. It may be influenced by Kuda rather than the cup itself. And in Europe, the cup idea is very different. Particularly, I checked up in Europe, the idea of coffee cup is very different than the way Indians look at it. Now, I thought that this may be a springboard to create a little bit of adventure. So I thought, why not we create bicultural products. The reason for that was that at that point, globalization was at its peak and everybody was looking at, you know, trying to appeal to both markets. So uh, just take an example of this kind. There is, there is a, there are bands here which belong to what one can call as the Indian hard rock. How could you design a CD cover which, which will appeal to people in the West as people in India. And this is where it must have bicultural roots, so it should borrow clues from the, in a way I return to the idea of representation from objects like CD cover. 
so this tool helped us look at locating albumness in the indian hard rock band and these are the ones which are popular at that point and people were asked to classify it so very typical had a certain way of doing it and as you go away from typical it started becoming you know less hard hard rock ness in it that's the way one could probably describe it we also looked at logos the typically bands have a name and they also create a logo type based on that and we found that hard rock logos are ambigrams they have symmetry they have they are mostly black and white in nature they also are evil in a way they are also spiky and devilish you know and as you go away from the typical that idea keeps changing it becomes diluted and probably also vanishes so here students created their own ambigrams of the names that they had about uh, their indian hot dog band and they also created cd covers you know which they were hoping that it will interest both the audience in india as well as abroad okay it's it's somewhat like you know in uh, music it, it's called as fusion music so it could be probably part of that but the best one is a very abstract way of doing it and it talks about a south indian hard rock band through an idli and a streak of blood so finally meaning making for a designer from a designer's point of view and that is the reason why i took that standpoint that designers make meaning though i know that it's a co creation that we are inducing people to create this co creation there are following things that are important you know, designers first want to change the world and they want to change the world the way they look at it and even if the world doesn't want to change or the people don't want it they do have an ambition of changing the world and there is nothing wrong in it that's something which the whole profession survives on uh, they do want to contribute to the changing of the meaning and that's a very very important thing that they want to do and making meaning should be an enjoyable struggle and that is what these tools allow you it makes them an enjoyable kind of a struggle the tools to control meaning to what matters most you know this is the most important aspect i i should be, i should create a tool which allows me to control meaning and also the tool should be able to create adventures you know the way we created adventures with cd covers for hard rock music one should be able to create adventures using that so thrill of making meaning as far as part 1 is concerned could actually be changed to the struggles of meaning making you know that could be a new title for this so that's an end of the part 1 sima would you like this to be discussed first and before i go to games because it will go to game little late it's a different area yeah sure i think uh, that's a good idea so if um um anybody who would like to sort of uh, ask any questions about uh, meaning making faru would you like to go first faru yeah. can you mute yeah sorry that that's that's a, a clear uh, indication that faru is falling asleep <laughs> yes no. <laughs> no. Oh, this, this is very good and just uh, Uh, listening to you it remind me about stuff that i used to teach back in time uh which uh, dear to my heart <clears throat> first i think you still using the word object as if i am following you correctly as a thing but uh talk in 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 the in the scope of the work that you're doing it made sense to me but let me share with you what i am connecting with what you have done a reminder for me about the notion of reframing i used to ask students i'm talking about graduate students master degree and and phd and ask them uh, i hold something in my hand as a thing or an object if you would and i say what what do you think this is can you list have two different list one is the conventional use and the other one unconventional use what you call a typical in in your presentation and then i ask them to feel free to be actually ridiculous and absolutely 
nothing prevent them from being radical. And then combine the two together to come up with something that they never really dream of. So the whole idea of typical, atypical, and the whole range of that, that I use in the way that I ask people to reframe a situation. Another thing that really was intriguing about what I'm hearing from you, you also reminded me about uh, there was one time and students get tired then lunchtime and they, and they said, well, it's lunchtime. We need to go and get some lunch. And I asked them, what, what are you going to have? Oh, I'm going to have a pizza. Oh, I'm going to have a sandwich. And I said, well, you're actually running into a thing. Could you tell me something about the quality and characteristics of what you desire to eat? For example, are you looking for something sweet, something salty, something tart? All these are characteristic and attribute that can lead to different things. When well, I'm talking about quality and attributes, and it turned around that when people think about qualities, they can come up with different manifestations of that quality. For example, if I say you probably, you want something sweet. Well, I could have something sweet as an apple. I can have something sweet as red bell pepper. I could have a kiss from the lips, which is red. They're all sharing the same characteristic redness, softness, fragrant, et cetera, et cetera. But they are different manifestation of the quality that they are seeking. So the work that you have done with students is really making sense to me to highlight, not to rush to a deliverable, as I was saying in my presentation, but quality that's being seeked that could be actually manifested through deliverable, which is things in my, in my way of describing that. So I'm, I'm making really a connection. You and I should, should talk more often. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very nicely done. I, I just thought I would explain. Categories basically are mental. So objects become things in mind. That's the way I interpreted it. You know, it's yeah. not exactly the way you interpret it, but objects have, uh, they exist in the real world, but they also exist as a map in the category, uh, in, in the mind, which tells you the right. gradation. So they don't exist independently but they exist right. as a map. So that's yeah. the difference between the two. Yeah. And that's obvious from because it comes from cognitive science. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's exactly. And as like John Dealey would say, uh, I cannot think of a, a, a mug. Uh, this is a thing, but what's in my mind is an object. Yeah. And the object of the cub, and this is the thing. So I think really, honestly, so many people are confused about the difference between object and a thing. Object can be changed in the mind. It's like def defy gravities, et cetera, et cetera. A thing has limitation by the gravity and the physicality. So in your work really was wonderful that people seek the quality and seek the object and characteristic of that which manifests as thing. That's why when you show wonderful example of your students' work, the whole idea of thinking as, a, as an object that is not trapped in a thing that can be on the spectrum of yeah. typical, atypical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Farooq. So uh, I'd like to uh, also welcome Salvatore, who's joined us. Um, and um, hi, Salvatore. Yes, hi. Oh. <laughs> Good to see you and welcome, welcome online. Uh, yes, to India. thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, I, I, I said you my English. I apologize, but my English is not so good. That's okay. Even our English is 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 absolutely. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a problem. 
I, I'm I'm old man and I study French and German and English is uh, the last language that I I began to to learn. So it's more imperfect. But I wrote my my paper and I will uh, read this paper and show uh, in the computer in uh, the slides. Huh? Okay, Salvador, I, let me let me introduce you first to the audience, yeah. because uh, Uday, uh, I, if anybody else has any questions for Uday before we move to Salvador, um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions because Uday is is like a, a very loved teacher um, of semantics in India. And uh, he's taught so many generations that uh, including SEPT and NID. Um, is there anybody who would like to, or uh, should we move to Salvatore? We, how? Sorry. Okay. So I will I will now introduce you. Thank you, Uday. That was yes, absolutely yes, yes. brilliant. Um, I mean, I have heard you so often that, uh, you know, I mean, it was like a deja vu and uh, it really felt so good to, to, you know, hear all that all over again. So we have to get you back to SEPT at some point soon. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you so much. Our Thanks next for the opportunity. Thank you, Uday. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Salvatore Zingale, whose work on semiotics and design forms the very essence of this conference. Salvatore is an associate professor of semiotics at the Department of Design at the Polytechnic University of Milan. On his own admission, he learned the science of science with Umberto Eco, his thesis advisor, and with Massimo Bonfantini, who asked him to collaborate with the semiotics department at the Polytechnic University in the early years of the course in industrial design. His uh, essential areas of interest are semiotics of the project, that is, on the role of interpretation semiosis in design processes, accessible communication, that is, communication aimed at obtaining benefits and services for the user, the development of the dialogical aspects of design, understood as project making activity, the study of the inventive processes in the design of artifacts, use of communicative aesthetics. Salvatore, without much ado, I now hand over the mic to you and we welcome you and we are absolutely privileged to have you. You know Farooq and Uday, right? So, um, yes, take over, so, Salvatore. So, I will share my screen. Yeah, make him the host. Yeah, you are the host, Salvatore, so you can be... Uh, so... You can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Sorry when I read, but this is the, the best way to express what I have in mind. <laughs> and it is not so 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 simple. So I the, the, the title is uh, semiotics research by or and to design, but my subtitle is the projectual habits. Uh Please not design habits. I will uh, ex explain the, the difference soon. So first, design changes semiotic research. My experience to, of teaching in a school of design has largely changed my view of semiotics. Not only because students require tools for their know-how, rather than for they know how to be, and this is different. Uh, know how to be is more uh, relevant for humanistic or philosophical uh, schools, but also because semiotic research for design is close in close dialogue with the design culture, involves reflection on how to use the semiotic categories. Indeed, the design mind has its gates turned toward the future. And while it is true that design requires to, the ability to analyze and read the present world, read and interpret the present world, it is even more true that it requires a method that enables it to peer into the world of the possible. 
uh, possible is uh, a key word in my, my semiotics uh, view. The confrontation with design research and on design, in fact, requires that the tools of semiotics also be put into research, as if design, which is an activity of making, places the search for meaning that is relevant for semiotics in a different dimension from that of the analysis of what is already made. I will. I, I mean that normally the uh, semiotician uh, <clears throat> are, um, works on analysis on the world, on the artifacts, text, as uh, something that is already made. But uh, in design, we have to do with is possible, not not yet made. Let me therefore interpret the topic of my intervention, my speech in this way. Semiotic research can be carried by design, that is in the field of design, because of the existence of design and then through design culture and design practice. There are some topics of semiotics theory that I have forwarded in my teaching at the School of Design in Milan over the last 20 years. Others, however, have remained at the margins. The topics I have placed at the center of my research represent what I consider a solid basis for what I do, for what I do Call, not called design semiotics, but project semiotics. And I will deal with this uh, different soon. Uh, before, uh, semiotics and the education of designers. I first want to focus on three considerations that I consider fundamental to better investigate relation, relationship between semiotic and design. The first, design is increasingly to be regarded not only as a profession, but I think so, but also as a social philosophy. We can say social applied philosophy. As Victor Margolin writes, uh, the capacity of the designers is to imagine and shape material and immaterial products that can address large scale human problems and contribute to social well being. So the designer is no longer asked to conceive and design artifacts whose aesthetic form brings art, the art, closer to the everyday life, as according, for example, to the Bauhaus utopia, but to care for social life. I will this make bold to care for such a life, the sense of a community, and at least in part, the life of the planet itself. The sustainability that we have been talking about more and more recent decades, in fact, entails first and foremost a different positioning of our human presence. We think the discussion about Anthropos Anthropocene, no longer one of dominance and exploitation of resources, but of relationship and conjugation with all other, other existence, human and non-human. The second consideration, <clears throat> Semiotics is not only a discipline that allows us to understand how different types of text, text and artifacts that are part of the environment of social landscape are conceived. It is often to say that semiotics task is to dissemble and reassemble texts to explain their organiza organization. 
And this only by asking how tax produce a certain effect, but not why they produce it. So I'm not of this opinion. As a social and cultural science, semiotics, like all sciences, has its own responsibility. It cannot but move on philo philosophical ground, positioning itself as a critical philosophy of its time, of our time. It cannot ignore, semiotic cannot ignore, for example, the ethical dimension of texts in design of artifacts and systems. The consequences they have on common sense, the consequences they have on common sense and thus on political and cultural orientation. For example, how responsible are advertising artifacts, packaging, audiovisual production for gender inequalities, and this is only one uh, example, or for stereotypes, social and cultural stereotypes. As well know Italian sociologist Marino Livolzi writes, the media have a strong capacity to influence opinions, attitude, and behavior, also because of the crisis of other socialization agency, family, school, etc. So the media uh, write Livolsi, but I can say the not only the media, but all artifacts that are uh, produced by design. Nor, especially if we talk about design, can semiotic ignore issues concerning health physical or mental and environmental sustainability. For example, how responsible are artifacts and home environments for people's health? What sense, what meaning lies behind industrial production that disproportionately and often unnecessarily increases the number of products just for the sake of profit, semiotics, at least when working closely with design and the training of designers, is also invested with the task of caring for social life. It is also to be conceived as social philosophy and perhaps even more as a philosophy for social life. For this reason, for several years, now with some colleague in Italy, we have been thinking that semiotic can also be understood as a normative science, not only a descriptive science, a tool for design processes, because the content of text and artifacts transcends the container and has an influence on the mind of consumers users and consumers. Finally, the third consideration, which brings us into the topic of this uh, meeting. We cannot assume that students at design school, especially in a course of about 50 hours over five years, will be able to acquire the technical matters of the semiotic discipline. Some concepts may Stick well, others will soon fade away. In my opinion, this makes the purpose of teaching semiotics in this field quite different from teaching it in a school or philosophy or communication sciences. Design does not really apply semiotics. It is semiotics that should implicitly guide its work. However, what semiotics can achieve is to work on certain semiotic processes in design. So, design semiotics and project semiotics. Before approaching the topic of uh, semiotic processes in design, it is necessar necessary to start with an 
inevitable preliminary question. Design semiotics or project semiotics? I know that normally we use design semiotics, but in Italian, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, a difference between design and progetto. Design is especially for product, communication, interior, fashion, design, and so on. Project, progetto is general. So what is the difference between design semiotics and project semiotics? As I have underlined many times before, it is possible and necessary to distinguish between design semiotics and project semiotics. The study of what happens in the field of design can thus lead to two distinct areas of semiotic research, although the former include the latter. So, one, the study of project making processes and to the study of the products of design. The former will take the name of semio design semiotics or semiotics of design, whereas the latter should be referred as to as project semiotics. This is um, a diagram that I think can explain this difference. These two branches can yeah can perfectly through a diagram. Design semiotics is part of a, a project semiotics and consists of the analysis of products and their signification. Project semiotics is the study of the processes that lead to design. The main object of the of the main object of study of design semiotics are the products of design. For project semiotics, the focus is instead on the processes, on the processes underlying the project making activity. Therefore, design semiotic is an applied semiotics. It gates over the artifactual text like text anal analysis of narrative or artistic text or of those ones called social practices. So applied semiotics is a semiotics of uh, literature, cinema, art, music, and etc. Project semiotics, on the other hand, is a specific semiotic comparable to text semiotics. This is a, a different that made Umberto Eco. Applied semiotics and specific semiotic and over general semiotics. The latter, as we know, can be divided, for example, into semiotics of literature, cinema, painting, and so on. Between text semiotics and design semiotics, to specific semiotics, however, there is a difference. Text semiotics has, at least theoretically, a defined and circumscribed object of study, the text. As Gianfranco Marrone, one of the most important semioticians in Italy, remind us the characteristic of textuality includes closure and tightness, that is, formal coherence and semantic coherence. But the semiotic of design, no, the project, sorry, the translation was the project semiotics on the other hand, as its object of investigation processes, design as process, design processes and design as process, which are in search of definition, therefore is open, sometimes is contractory, exposed to change and surprise. When we start to design, to project, we don't know 
the, the form of final result. So semiotic processes in design, I will focus about only three cases. This is my uh, main uh, research field. So let us consider for the moment three quest questions to be posed at the basis of project semiotics. From this question derive three processes that are at the same time processes of semiosis, not semiotics, semiosis. Semiosis is the process to produce a meaning, sense, and design processes. I select three of them. First, why and for whom we design artifacts? The question leads us to the dialogue dialogic or dialogical process, which consists of the ability to listen and to relate both with the client and with the user, and above all, to know how to make use of dialogue as a tool for knowledge and exploitation. Two, how can we move from the need or, need or desire or the vulgar demands of a client to an artifact that can best interpret this all. This question leads us to translation process, which consists in being able to move from an indeterminate set of contents, indeterminate set of content, from contents without expression, to an artifacts that can communicate them and make them available. Three, how can we design the most appropriate artifact for our purpose? And this question leads us to the inventive process, which consists in the ability to be able to observe and interpret both in response to a problem and in the ability to discern in a phenomenon that present itself to the mind an epiphanic vision, an epiphany, an epiphanic vision that transcended it. A phenomenon, uh, say, about itself. An epiphany says to us, speak, speak to, to us. So I will deal briefly with the first, first two processes and more extensively with the third, albeit from a particular point of view. So why, who, why, how, for whom, the dialogue basis of the project. In English, design means also intention. And by design means intentionally. Design is also acting from an intention, which we can call semiotic intention semiotic intention. By this expression, I mean the intention to produce an action that is realized in an act of enunciation or in the production of an artifact. As my colleague Michela Deni argues, the production of an artifact is a form of enunciation. But enunciation enunciation, at least uh, as it was introduced by the French uh, linguistic Emile Bonveniste, rest on, on, uh, rests on a dialogue's basis. And I addressing to a you through an act of communication. 
So, with uh, recourse to John Austin's and John Searle's theory of speech acts, but in addition by my 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 professor Massimo Bonfantini, I have elaborated this scheme. One, we leave all in a social and culture, cultural contest. This is evident. This is the a design process from left to right. Three, we move from social motivation and we go to social consequences. But here in the middle, we have first a semiotic intention, why? Uh, then a semiotic effect for one, and in the middle, as mediation, a, a semiotic product, what, the artifact. I will better explain this, this, uh, this diagram. First, every project action starts within a given social and cultural context. We cannot fail to notice that even if we consider the era following the Second World, uh, World War, the last, uh, the last uh, decades, the scale of social and cultural contests have changed dramatically. The world is becoming more and more multicultural and multilingual. A semiosphere, this is concept from Yuri Lotman, where different languages and sensitivities coexist, a world that is where relations of otherness multiply every day. Two, every design action follows a dialogue logic because it involves a relational exchange. This, uh, this part is dialogical design, I, I named this dialogical design logic. So uh, the, logic, uh, the logic, logic, because it involves relation, relational exchange, direct or implicit between designer and user through the mediation of an artifact. The logical logic consists in a series of inferences, the designer, must be able to imagine the future modes of use of an artifact, while the user must discover what logic underlies an artifact and it is as it is conceived. Three, but no project has reason to exist if there are no social motivation that create a condition of for its existence. At the same time, for the existence of an artifact brings with a series of consequences more or less relevant. So three social motivation for here, social consequences. But the actual, actual start of a design process occurs when an objective or semiotic intention takes shape in the mind of the designers. Designers is understood also as a plural subject. It's not one person, only one person. This is the why of the project. The intention answers the question, for what reason is it necessary to design and produce these artifacts? Six, on the opposite side, we place the semiotic effect. As Edgar Allan Poe already argued in the philosophy of composition, what we want the user's response to be for whom we intend to design and how we want to influence their behavior emotionally, the cognition, so the semiotic effect answers the question for whom is necessary to design and produce this artifact. 
last, but at the center of the scheme here, seven, sorry, we place the semiotic product, the artifact or the system or the service, which on one hand has the task of interpreting uh, represent and representing the semiotic intention. On the other hand, it has the task of facilitate, facilitating the searches of the semiotic effect. In both cases, everything depends on how the artifact is presented, why and how. The semiotic product answer the question through which aspect of my artifact can both the intention and the semiotic effects become operational? So I, now the translation from undefined content to a defined form. In this case, to deal with the translation process, reference is firstly made to Louis Jemslow and its B-plane model, which, however, comprises not just two levels, but three. Indeed, what Jemslow called poor port must also be taken into consideration. The un poor port is the undifferentiated set for, of all possible content, uh, independent from a language, independent from a signification system. This is the diagram. The poor part is uh, the amorphous and undifferentiated matter or whole possible content. This is the um, B-plane uh, model, expression, and, and content. So in design, translations not used to let things be understood in another language, as in, uh, in translation between two, two tongues, two language, but to give a valid expressive visual or material shape to what was originally lacking shape or defined textual structure. In design, the act of translation is essentially a way from making an entire universe of content available to the user. So the translation process acting in design can be represented through a two-phase model or three-phase model. Thus, for example, the translation process can be represented in the data visualization. Zero, this is the zero phase, the starting phase. We have a data set. Data sets are content and data as social problematic needs. They, are in, they have no shape, no form. The first translating phase is to to bring this indifferentiated contents to a text. So content and data analyzed and textualized. And we have a briefing test. Briefing test is not uh, an artifact, is, a, uh, is the textualization of, of all contents. The second phase is translating phase, is the design phase. Contents and data are present in an artifact. And then we have a really artifact test, for example, an infographic. So we have zero, the interpretation of the content. And this is the really object of the translation. Then the, the textualization of the content, the production of an instruction text, and the translation into a form of expression. It is the production of an artifact test. 
design does present itself as a translation for at least three interrelated aspects. First, the first aspect concerns what design has in common with translation proper, linguistic translation, interlinguistic translation. To act as a factor of mediation, mediation and access between a set of content and a user or reader. If one translates, it is because someone needs access to an otherwise inaccessible semantic world, because they do not know the language or because they are unable to see it clearly or for other or for other various reasons. Hence the second aspect, being an act of mediation and access makes both translation and design a process that rests on the logic of a mathematical function. I mean, the text artifact is a dependent variable of an original content, which constitutes the independent variable. Consequently, I think this is more clear, in design, one can properly speak of translation because the form of expression of the text artifact, the final result, is one of the many possible form that can be generated from a text instruction, from the textualization of undefinite uh, contents. The designer is in fact to ask it, the designer is in fact not asked to create, but rather to translate into an artifact, an instance that is expressed and communicated in another way, or that fails to be expressed appropriately. So, and now the inventive transformation. Uh, how much time I have? 10 minutes? Salvatore, well, yes, yes, 10 minutes. Ten. Okay, inventive transformation. Invention, like epiphany, is a mental process that has its logical form in abduction, in abduction, as introduced and elaborated by philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. To abduction applies to design, I have dedicated a few essays. The latest is uh, the abduction of future, thanks to Mattia, which can be found online in open access. And I dedicate also a book. This application to design is in fact an elaboration of the teaching of Massimo Bonfantini and its philosophy of an invention. Here I want to focus on the role that a mental image, mental image is an important concept, mental image, not the picture, a mental image plays in the elaboration of that abduction and thus in inventiveness. I call it the mediating image. The mediating image because, as we know, semiotics is in fact the science of the various form of mediation that enables us to launch the imagination beyond the mere perception of phenomena. The project semiotics for its part is also concerned with our ability to imagine possible words and objects to make our system easier and more pleasant. In design, this is almost always approached with the concept of innovation. However, the concept of innovation still has a methodological gap. 
what does innovation come from? In other words, what kind and form of thinking is required to produce innovation? The answer to this question constitutes the first of two statements I want here present, present here. First, there can be no innovation activity without inventive thinking. And there is no inventive thinking without those paths to which abduction only can take us. The second statement is, inventiveness can also reveal itself in the shape of a sudden or immediate vision, like the insight or in German Einsicht of the Gestalt theory. But to be also, but to be, sorry, but to be put into practice, such vision still needs some form of organization, a method. We know that inside is a concept connected to the idea of intuition, as if uh, a thought could come to the mind by itself without any inferential effort or process. Inside is namely something that we suddenly see inside of us. In many cases, it really seems to happen in this way. The solution to a problem come to us unexpected, like a flash of light in the darkness. However, such description can be valid only from a psychological point of view, not from the point of view of logic or semiotics. As Peirce already pointed out, the production of meaning semiotics and hence the understanding of what happens in the mind and what is capable of must necessarily happen through a mediation. He said, if right wrote, we have no, we have no power to, of thinking without science, so without mediations. The presence of mediation can has consequences and teaches something important for the development of the inventive thinking of various reasons. First, because new ideas always go through our no ones, no matter if consciously or somehow hidden in the back of our minds. What matter here, here is the awareness that somewhere inside us we can find a foothold, the mediating element, to proceed. Such an element is generally an image, not only in its literal meaning of visual input or picture, but also in its wider meaning of any sensual element that we can perceive in the shape of a figure. This meaning mediating image is that vision we are looking for. However, this image needs to be in the first instance interpreted and then transformed and then transformed. Finally, it needs to be resembled and elaborated using metaphor or analogy. I bring two examples. It can be asserted that when looking for a solution to a problem, we must not just aim at the result, but rather at crossing a ford, enabling us to transit beyond the river, beyond the problem. The first example that can be cited is the solution to a problem often used to explain the concept of insight. The candle task of Carl Dunker. So how can a candle be hung to a wall because there is no other place to lay it? Just using some matches and the packet of drawing pins there are two ways to proceed. We can fail and retry by assemb assembling the object we have in different ways or by association 
of ideas. Association of ideas by, by, by abduction. We can think about an object having a similar function, even if in a different way. There, the best and maybe only solution is to think about a shelf to nail to the wall on which to put the candle. So this is the problem and here is the solution. The question is, without a mental link to the image of the shelf, the mediation, would we be able to find a solution? We can, but uh, okay. The, the second example is the, about the, a surprising image. The second, the second example, I'm going to illustrate is mediating the mediating image as a double value. The image is foreign to us in the sense that it does not belong to our background knowledge, nonetheless we are able to embrace it as familiar, linked to something pertaining our inner inner self. This image cannot be found in the people's world, but it somehow inhabits my, my environment. This is a paradox, but not only. In this case, the same existence of the problem lead us to discovering the existence of a non-explicit mediation. So in this case, this is the case of Vasily Kandinsky and this painting between the uh, first year of the uh, year under, which is something called this painting composition and other times improvisation in analogy with the art of music, but not only. Differently form differently from the later works of Kandinsky, in this painting, everything happens inside the picture. It appears to be no preparation there, not even an outside world to take as a model. There is only the microcosm composed by artists, colors and canvas. As we already know, Kandinsky invented the concept of painting with no subject, the abstract art, abstract painting completely by chance, because a painting of his that was, was leaning against the wall at the side. On that occasion, Kandinsky found an image that has that was hidden secretly until then, harbored in this previous heart. Kandinsky knew that in those images he was about to find his poetics, where he did not have to refer to any outside image, but rather connect with his inner doubt and concerns. So, in this case, the project-making attitude is uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> in this case, the project make attitude is also a search from an identity of which we are still unconscious, which we feel like having or belonging to, but still lake. An identity that is an otherness to which we belong, but still have not explored. That is why we usually try to recognize, recognize it, it in an image outside us. Boring yet familiar. Boring because it is really outside of us, of our personal environment and experience, 
and the encounter with such unknown happens accidentally, poorly unexpectedly. But it is familiar because we immediately recognize it as part of our habitat when we suddenly encounter it without knowing why. So I have here 10 steps of inventing thinking, but I go direct to the conclusion because these 10 points described above, no, really conclusion is this, sorry. I make it uh, easier. To conclude, really, I increasingly think that semiotics should teach designers to acquire three habits. Habits is a concept from Charles Peirce. The inventive habits, the inventive habits which include the dialogic habits, which leads to the translate, translate habits. As the French philosopher Francois Julien says, the language of the future is translation. And I would, I would add, add the design of future is the inventive habit. So thank you very much and Sorry for my English. Not at all. Salvatore, Russia. that was that was amazing. That was really amazing. I mean, your English was more than perfect. So oh. uh, <laughs> I mean it, it was it was absolutely and, and I can't tell you how privileged we are to have had you speak to us and uh, share your text with us. Yes, um, yes, I will send you. Yeah, but but absolutely, uh, you know, very very uh, or you know, useful um, presentation today about um, the idea of translation, the idea of habit, because um, what we what we really need to inculcate in the design is the notion of habit. So, um, if you can just sort of talk, explain a little more about the concept of habit for the designers present here uh, you know so uh, what what is this process by which we can inculcate habit okay mm. uh, sina may i have um, um, two minutes to to find yes uh, yes yes uh, um, slide about this argument is uh, absolutely is take your time okay just a moment you can sure, see my sure, sure. sure. i can my can my yeah you can okay. you can mute your mic if you want <laughs> yes so uh, for for the audience uh, we will break for lunch uh, after uh, if anybody has any questions to salvatore after that we will break for lunch and um, uh, we will have uh, rodrigo joining us from portugal um, and we will have first uday atwankar talking about game design and then rodrigo uh, who will join us from portugal who will talk about design pedagogy uh, so uh, do stay on and join us at around 1.30. Um, what's the time now? Yeah, around 1.30 uh, India time. And uh, it'll be a pleasure to have you all back with us again. Seema, you may want to mention about the changes. Yes, uh, yes. And, and Christina and Velvet have, uh, Christina unfortunately has fallen sick. Um, and uh, Velvet uh, had, had, has had an emergency travel. So what, what we will do is we will have another, a third round of this conference uh, where I will include um, uh, Tamper, uh, Matia, Oguz, and four or five of these uh, speakers um, in a third uh, you know, round. So do, do keep your eyes open for announcement for a third round of this conference. Um, so that, uh, you know, you we get must perspectives from Tampere as well. Yes, Salvatore, please continue. So I I try to explain this with two two diagrams, and 
with a quote from, from Peirce or, or similar. So in this diagram, we have three moments, uh, doubt, belief, and habit. Peirce says that uh, we live normally, normally in doubt, irritation of doubt. That means that uh, we don't know what we have to, to think, to believe, no? So we have the necess uh, we necessary, we, we, we have to become from doubt to a belief. And they say belief is uh, the thought at rest, no? Quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, in the science, this is normal, you know? I don't know how, uh, how is a process, and then, then I make a research, and then, okay, I have a belief. Belief is not uh, uh, security. I think that the thing that the state of thing is so and so. Hmm? Then he said we have uh, four uh, method to fixation a belief. No? For example, I believe that uh, this is so and so because I think that is so and so. No, and normally. Many many people, <laughs> we, we we think so, no? but then we we can uh, hear um, someone that have an authority and says no, this the things is not so and so. Then we think uh, okay, I think this this is so so because he or she said so. For example, the television said that, the, the, my doctor said that, in internet I read that. Or philo many philosophers uh, uh, have uh, the uh, build here, belief uh, uh, a priori. No? Right. This is so so because uh, we have no, no alternative. We, we, we know that it's so. The only way to have uh, uh, a really belief, say it purse, and I think this is a, <laughs> this is a, a common opinion now, is uh, uh, to have a scientific method, experimental method. So, but uh, I is better when so the second second uh, passage from belief. To an habit. When we have a belief or many beliefs, then we have the necessity to have an habit. Habit is a disposition to action. That means that I experiment that in, in behavior, for example, an action uh, bring me to a positive result. And so I make this uh, in the future. Uh, until I discover, for example, that this uh, this action is not so bring me not so in, in the right uh, in the right dimension. So, doubt is what we don't know. I don't know. Belief is what I know that I know that yeah. is. But habit, it I know how. Uh, okay. So. For this, for this reason, I think in the design uh, uh, education, uh, many semiotics arguments and categories uh, have to 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 lead here to have a, a yes, a inventive habit, inventive mind, and, and in, to able to know what means translating. No, that yeah. the process. I, I I teach on uh, also in a, in a, um, uh, final studio in data visualization and data visualization is a, a, a translating process. Huh? So um, other habit is this uh, dialogical habit. I think that uh, there is no designer that can uh, also all designer have to. To, to be able to to have dialogue ha dialogue that means to 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 her and to in the interaction and etc 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, here is a a, a, a definition from 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 Peirce. Have it different from disposition in having been acquired as consequences of the principle virtually well know even to those whose powers of reflection are insufficient to its formulation, that multiple rate rated behavior of the same kind under similar combination of percepts and fences produce a tendency, the habit, actually to behave in a similar way under similar circumstances in the future. When an habit is no, no good, we can change the habit. The word habit comes from Latin, habito, and in mm -hmm. Italian, habito is a cloth. <laughs> no? We can change our cloth when our clothes are, uh, are old or uh, sure. we not good. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Salvatore. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, uh, anybody uh, else who would like to, uh, you know, utilize this opportunity because we we got Salvatore, uh, of, you know, after like a lot of uh, difficulties in persuading him. So please take the opportunity to ask him questions. Otherwise, of course, there are his works uh, on the, on the uh, you have a web page, right, Salvatore? Um, and your work is so of immense importance to to design and designers. But you have a web page. Oh, please. You have a web page where you put up your articles. Oh, yes, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> I I must uh, increase it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody who would like to ask a question? Uh, so, I mean, so so how is habit uh, uh, for a designer different from an instinct for a designer? Instinct. Yes, but instinct is uh, too an habit, an habit that uh, becomes in the evolutionary history of the, of the world. Eh? Uh, we, we know what uh, uh, our animal friends uh, Cats uh, uh, yeah. and and uh, dogs make. Né? They they his behavior is behavior through uh, habits, and these habits uh, we have not from from God uh, yeah. <laughs> or from, from itself. Né? We, we have uh, developed in, in the history of the evolution. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Salvatore. Uh, if if there are no other You're questions, hmm? uh, thank you. And uh, we, if there are no other questions, we'll break for lunch, Salvatore. Uh, okay. And we will have Rodrigo who will join us post lunch um, in about uh, half an hour. Half, half an hour, okay. Okay. Uh, we'll have Uday who will first, uh, you know, complete his talk on game design and then Rodrigo. So I welcome you all back in about half an hour. Uh, the Zoom uh, will be on. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to you all back after lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Uday. Uday, this yeah. is Rodrigo. He'll be speaking after you. Uday is a professor of industrial design and game theory. And nice so, yeah, so so he is so. And is Salvatore back? He gave a brilliant, brilliant speech. As yes. always. As always, yes. <laughs> yes, Uday. Yeah. Shall I share the screen? Share, yes, you, you made him. Is it visible? Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah, part two. Okay. So shall I start now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is the second part of my presentation. Uh, we talked about objects and the meaning that they create and the way you can control that meaning. Uh, I thought I had some solutions till I started designing on games and then I realized that meaning making is a lot more complex 
when it comes to game design. And because games are a very unique object, let's go to some of these interesting new problems that you encounter when you uh, start designing games. Uh, first is a little bit of a background that uh, I've been designing games for quite some time now. It's almost about 15 years or so. And a lot of these games have already come in the market through Fun School, and one of them came from a, uh, a company in Japan. I'm all the time I have been trying to understand the gameness of the game. You know what makes game a game, and that's just very tough question to answer. I mean, I'm still at it, and I'm writing about it, but uh, there's no clear answer on that. These are some of the games which came via Fun School. One of them is about prime numbers. The other one is about spy and you know decoding messages. This is about visual thinking, and this is about strategy. A lot of these games uh, were introduced about ten or ten or twelve years ago, roughly. After afterwards, I started thinking of games as a research area, and I realized something very interesting: that each game has a language to converse. And it's moderated. It's almost like a moderated debate. You know, what happens between two players is very similar to the way debates are conducted. You know, there's there's a referee there or an umpire there, and you know he sort of controls the whole thing. Similar thing happens in game. And I'm not talking about only chess, but even if you look at tennis, it's the same story. It's except that the way of speaking is nothing to do with language as such, but it uses its own unique language to converse. But conversation definitely goes on. It can also become very strange because I we designed a game where you cannot see, and uh, you know you have to recognize and then exchange uh, shapes with each other to create a complete square. And this was an interesting game because the, there is a conversation there, there is a fun there, but you cannot see. So it's one of the unique cases of conversation. There was also another game, a game which I have not uh, added here, which is played with eye movements. You know? So it's possible that two people in a team can actually uh, talk to each other through eye movements and not through language. Uh, the second part is uh, what are the, what are the elements of this language? First element of the language is the tokens. You know, the pieces that we use, the ball, the racket, and these are the kind of uh, entities that we use to create conversation between two players so but believe me that players uh, actually the game is played in the mind it is nothing to do with playing on the physical game is just a manifestation but it, uh, look at the strategies that people develop in uh, uh, chess you know they they think for about few minutes decide what to do compare all alternatives and all this happens in the mind and it's only at the last moment that they would put the piece in the new place and uh, challenge the other person so it's a very interesting way of creating a kind of a debate where initially it is played in the mind and then it gets uh, played later uh, later in the on the board or in the court or whatever it is. So words are uh, words are something like tokens and objects that we use as and they all are in a setting. You know, for instance, chess has a board, tennis has a court, badminton has a court, cricket has a cricket ground. And there are limitations that are imposed by the setting in which the tokens operate. It's a con uh, so the setting provides a context, a context, and there are they are used to communicate. But interestingly, they are also used to confuse your opponent. And this is something which is interesting about conversation in game. A lot of it is hidden so that your intentions are never transferred to. Your opponent. So you idea is to catch him on the surprise by you know you you might create mu one and mu two and mu three, but you have a bigger plan in mind which gets revealed only partially. So it's a kind of a conversation that goes on revealing meaning over a over a long period. There is another concept in game called game states. So game state is a kind of a, a position of all the pieces or everything, all entities. At any given point on which the person is uh, opponent is supposed to react is a game state. Now there are most games have static games. You know, for instance, chess has a static game. And once player A plays and he puts his piece, 
player B has a time to look at it and then decide what he wants to do. So it is turn by turn the display. But more complex games, like for instance, basketball or, or a cricket or soccer, the game sets are continuously evolving. Every second is a different uh, game set. Uh, you cannot call it as it's sort of an intermediate steps through which the games go. So it's a very complex uh, thing to process and it's continuously evolving and you don't know which is the direction in which you evolve. What is it that opponent is likely to do in the next moment is unknown. So most of the game decisions that the people, people take are based on anticipation, expecting that this will happen or X happens or Y happens. Uh, I think I, most interesting part about uh, meaning making in game is that uh, I've shown you one chessboard which is a part of a middle game which is being played by some two people uh, and I've just frozen that particular sequence. Now, this has a meaning for several reasons. One is each local, each token is or each piece is located somewhere. It has its own properties and attributes, but the major part of the meaning comes in the way they are connected to each other to create a strategy. And same uh, that a, Opponent needs to decode that strategy by looking at the relationship. It's not a single piece that it defines, it's, but it's several groups of pieces in a particular geometry that defines the meaning. So it's not a simple meaning uh, that you would be able to sort of look at it and decide. Uh, so you actually also need a grammar to decode. You must know the rules well in order to decode that message. So both the opponents must share a common grammar. And that's what games are all about. What happens if I randomly put the same number of pieces I put randomly, the entire game board that you see is a completely meaningless board. It can probably be played, but it will not be played properly because nobody knows why the pieces are where they are. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it is in games, nothing is random. Everything that happens has a meaning behind it. And in fact, that meaning is revealed over a fairly long period, you know, and, and several moves. And this is true of many games. So, interesting part about similarities between language learning and game learning is that you learn your language by speaking, by making corrections as you go along, or somebody else corrects you, or a teacher corrects you. Huh? Same thing happens in games. You know, you actually you cannot learn game by reading a book. You have to play. And you have to play, make mistakes, learn. And it's an idea, it's a kind of a situation that happens uh, uh, all the time in the game that it is learned exactly like a language. Second thing is you, when you start, you are a novice, like a language. You know, when a child starts speaking, he's a novice, he makes mistakes, he makes mistakes in grammar or, you know, uh, in usages of letter or sequences of uh, uh, words. He, but Converse, he manages to converse and over a period becomes a competent player or a competent speaker. Over a period, he learns to excel and then become a master player or a great writer. So, and that's exactly where the last similarity comes in. And that is when the players become artists, they learn to exploit rules to create art. All that you got to do, game actually game playing is an art and all that you got to do is to watch Federer play or watch Pele play and you realize what art is. You know? That it's only people who excel and master that they can create an art. So the point that I'm making is the difference between objects and uh, uh, games uh, or games as objects is as follows. First is it allows players to converse or debate with each other. And this is a, a very special form of conversation because it uses some kind of a, a coded language and a grammar. Okay, The contents are expressed through tokens and altered game states. That means the, the way you converse is you alter the game state in order that your adversary or your uh, opponent reacts to that particular game. So it's the conversation that goes through change of game states and it happens continuously. Each game can be treated as a new language. That's also possible uh, because every time, you see, for instance, if you if you know soccer, that doesn't mean you can play tennis. And if you know tennis, that doesn't mean you can play chess. 
So each game has its own language and that language is full of its own rules and grammar. And each game is learned like a language. You know, you start as a novice and you know, become an expert over a period. And lastly, me meaning making in game is a relationship of elements and entities on in the setting. It, all this is required. The setting is required. The relationships are required. Uh, the geometrical relation I'm talking about and uh, the properties of each of the token is required in order to understand what the message is. The point that I'm making is that game is a very interesting problem. I'm not sure whether semiotics can, uh, people have handled semi uh, using semiotics, the kind of discourse that takes place in game, but if it does, it will be wonderful. The only one reference I found, which is a, a book called Rules of Play, which is the, one of the classic books on game, where there are only a few a few pages, about four pages on semiotics, which talks about it. But it's really not what uh, it could do. You know, and the complexities of games are far too many to really understand. And maybe a, a deeper study of semiotics might be able to do it. I haven't been able to find a handle on it myself, but I thought I would open it up as a possibility for discussion. Okay. So that's it. Thank you so much, Uday. It was uh, very nice, the transition from, uh, you know, your semantics to uh, game design and uh, the fact that you're, you're uh, trying to, uh, you know, understand whether semiotics can contribute. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, do you have any, any views on this? Or um, uh, how is, is there anything that, It'll really be useful if, because you have a student who is doing toy design, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I think it's uh, uh, an amazing task to, to, to get. To talk about game design is not something easy. Uh, here in our university, we have uh, a game design bachelor, uh, and we try to to work with different areas in design and outside design also like in medicine like in different fields and i have this student alakesh who is developing uh, uh actually the the final product are toys for for young children but this has a, a big social power behind the idea he has. Uh, it's something I always tell him, you know, like, okay, the final project, we can say you are developing toys, but you are developing so much more than that because you are developing a social idea. You are fighting for equity. You are fighting for human rights and everything behind a game, behind a toy. And this is what I find very interesting uh, in this presentation and this idea, because uh, it's easy for us to, to look to a game or a toy or anything like that and think, oh, okay, it's project design, but it's not project design. We have so much power in our hands. We have so much uh, languages behind a, a game and, to, to look through this from a semiotic point of view, uh, it, it, it's kind of connected to, to what I'm going to, to talk about next, uh, how we can think about language before thinking about the final artifact. It doesn't matter if this final artifact is uh, a game, is a toy or it's some decoration we have in our houses, but the social power we have as designers is what really amazes me because when we are developing a game, just, just like that, we are not developing only a game. We are developing how people are going to deal with the world, you know, how people are going to deal with each other, how people are going to learn new languages, how people are going to learn new rules, and this have a big impact in our lives. So that's why I would like to congratulate you on your presentation and your research, because it really shows 
this social power, the this power to to fight for a better world we have as designers and as researchers in design. So congratulations. Thank yeah, you. And that's true, Rodrigo. And I think today uh, games, uh, you know, have always had the power. I think we we sort of somewhere. Um, have, um, uh, it, you know, we need to differentiate between board games, which is where you come from, right? You, mm -hmm. you design board games and the kind of games that we have on the internet or the, 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 the kind of visual culture that is being promoted um, as a result of that. So I think that there is a need to do a lot of research and work on, on and, and on understanding what is out there you know so i think in that sense your work is very very significant and uh, we're really look, looking forward to your book uh on game design today yeah it should be there sooner let's go <laughs> Let's yeah see. thank you yeah. so much today any other questions before we move on to rodrigo Anybody who would like to uh, ask um, Uday? Okay, so I will now introduce uh, Rodrigo Morez, who is um, who uh, I met in in uh, in the World Congress last year, and uh, I attended his session on uh, you know pedagogy in schools of design, and I was completely taken up. Uh, and um, I met him at the airport at Thessaloniki and I said, you know, Rodrigo, we just have to have you in some form uh, in India. And I'm so glad it has worked out. So he will speak on the foundations, research and transdisciplinarity, reshaping education for the 21st century at a school of design and technology in Portugal. Uh, this is part of the Springer series in design and innovation. Uh, volume 14. So for those of you who would like to buy the book, uh, do, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, look at uh, the Springer series and you can purchase the book. As far as Rodrigo is concerned, um, his entire bio is in Portuguese. So I'm going to attempt <laughs> to translate and, 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 and uh, Rodrigo, you will have to uh, forgive me if I miss out, but I am going to do it from Portugal, Portuguese. I, I said I decided not to do it from English. So if, uh, if you want, I can I can make a quick presentation and please do. That will be wonderful. You are excused to 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 try but, to. But but but, but I but Portuguese. yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah. I would have liked to do that, but I mean it is it is fascinating because I am partly from Goa. So, uh, you know, <laughs> but please, please tell us about yourself, Rodrigo. I think uh, you're, yes, that'd be wonderful. Thank so you. First of all, thank you, Sima, for this beautiful organization you've been doing for this event. Uh, we talked about this before and this idea you had to bring all these important people together to to talk a little bit about semiotics and design it's so important we we do not have much space to talk about design and we never have space to talk about semiotics so it's it, yeah, it, 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 uh, we are far and few between species now <laughs> yeah it's very powerful to do something like this so i'll try to make a quick presentation uh i'm rodrigo rodrigo morais Actually, I'm Tell from, us about yourself first, Rodrigo. Yeah, actually, I'm from Brazil, uh, but I live in Portugal for a long time. Uh, I, I've been teaching design for 15 years, and don't ask my age, okay? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, it, it means like, okay, I started two years old, now I'm 17, as you can see in my face. Um, so now here in Portugal, I work in the first design universe we have in Portugal. Uh, this universe was created 60 years ago. And now here, I'm the coordinator for the pedagogical practice of the university. We have four 
vertical areas in our university. Uh, one of them is design, of course, it's the first one, but we have three others, which is technology, marketing, and communication. And my work as a coordinator of the pedagogical practices is to bring projects that connect design to all the other three areas we have, but also connects design to other areas from other institutions, other researchers, and mainly from other universities. So we work like design for health, design for uh, social problems, design for environmental problems. We are always seeking to, to make transdisciplinary projects, having basis on design, but trying to, to task problems from different fields. And that's why I'm going to, to talk a little bit today about uh, how we can, first of all, try to define design. I will not try to define design as my last statement in the world, but I will give you some point of view about what is design and how we can teach design and how we've been teaching design here in our institution, here in Portugal, and how we can use design, how our students are using design in different fields, in different areas, in connection to different people. This is it. This is me. This is what I do. <laughs> I think your mic is off, Sima. Before you go ahead, I just wanted to introduce you to our Dean Salim Batri, um, uh, who's who's been very, very supportive for this conference. So Salim, that is Rodrigo. And uh, Hi, Rodrigo. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being part of this conference. I think Seema has done an amazing job of getting this diverse yeah. group of people across uh, multiple continents to come and speak about a very complex part of design, uh, yeah. meaning and, and semiotic theory. Um, and uh, interestingly, today we had some very, uh, I would say, powerful discussions and yeah. talks on design process and the complexity involved in design process. and. Uh, how in fact, um, whether it's abductive aspects of it or um, perhaps even uh, not necessary uh, design as a problem problem solving uh, process, but um, other layers coming into design process. So um, in that same line, I'm happy to hear about design education um, and your experiences in Portugal. Uh, so welcome and thank you so much for being part of this conference. Thank you, Salim. Th yeah, I thank you. Nice to meet you, Salim. And I, I completely agree with you. The, this job Sima have done to bring all these people together, each one of us from a different part of the world. Uh, I just cannot wait for what she can do next. Like she's <laughs> going to bring people from the moon, from other planets, because it was a very short time, but she have done an amazing, amazing task force to do this. Well, I have I have wonderful students. So, Sally, uh, Rodrigo, we made you a co-host. Okay, okay. You can so, share your you can share your presentation if you okay. want. Okay, uh, just let me start here. Um, I think you can see. Just let me put this full screen. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, how much time do I have, Sima? I have all the time in the world. <laughs> oh, okay. So <laughs> wait there, guys. We are going to be here all day long now. How will not take so <laughs> much time? Uh, so I'll just add to you, Sima, this is the uh, last... Uh, last presentation, uh, yes. The, there were a couple of which have got moved. Um, so Yeah, so, yeah. So uh, you're the last speaker for the day. Okay. Can I start, Simon? Yes, please. So, first of all, nice to meet you guys. Uh, I really would like to be there with you. As I told Sima before, it's one thing I was to do in life. I'll go to India. I've never been in India, but uh, it's 
already a pleasure to to be here connected with you um as i said when i introduced myself i'm going to talk a little bit about uh how we can teach design and actually not how we can teach design but how we've been teaching design here in portugal and how we can apply design uh, as a professional in our everyday so how we can act as designers i will show you some results we are having from this process from this uh pedagogical practices we are having here in portugal so i will show you also at the end uh, some works our students have been developing and I would not like to make this like a one-way conversation so if you want to talk to me just turn on your cameras turn on your microphones you can stop me anytime and let's make this more like talking to each other I don't hold the truth of anything I'm just showing you some thoughts of mine and my colleagues here in Portugal. So let's talk about it. Maybe you have some ideas that we can implement in this idea. Let's make this more like a, a conversation overall. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, to talk about design education, to talk about teaching design, we cannot start talking about those things if we do not ask ourselves one very small and simple thing what is design because if i'm proposed to teach design if i'm proposed to uh to be a designer to work as a designer I must know what this is and it might seem like a very a very simple question to make, but it's not a very simple question to answer. When we look to other more traditional areas, when we look to engineering, when we look to law, when we look to psychology and everything, those guys have really easy ways to define what they do what they teach and everything but how many times have you questioned yourselves what is design and how many classes you had with different professors trying to define design and each one of them had a different answer because the fact is we do not have an answer we do not have an answer a final answer to say this is design we don't we just don't we have different perspectives we have different points of view and i'm not trying here to define design as well i'm not here to to make a final statement but to begin i would like to try to to make an overall situation about how we can look to what we say is design one of the most uh, known uh, statement about it is design uh, about what is design comes from Glenn Parsons and Mike Monteiro uh, actually this is not a final statement also because it's a blend between two definitions but this is the definition most people in the world try to bring to say what is design so those guys as you can see say that design is the intentional solution of a problem within a set of constraints by the creation of plans for a new sort of thing where the plans would not be immediately seen by a reasonable person as an inadequate solution uh, as we can see, it's not easy also because this is a very long statement and think about you like design students when your grandparents ask you, oh, so what you are going to do in your life and you are going to say to them, oh, I'm going to be a designer and they will ask you, oh, so what is design? Imagine yourselves trying to tell your grandparents this sentence they will be more confused than they were before and 
worse than that. They were going to be more worried because if they didn't know what you were doing, now if you give this explanation, they will think you're crazy because what is that, you know? And this is from I, uh, this is where from I would like to, to start. As you can see here, maybe I'm going to tell you there is a problem with it. Actually, there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, it's not to say that those guys are wrong, but yes, maybe I will bring some problems with that. But don't tell Parsons and Montero, they are amazing guys. They are really smart people, but let's not get them upset. It works. This definition works, but we can try to make it simpler, you know. First of all, there are three main problems, let, let's say problems with this definition that I look at them and think that this is a little problematic. First thing is, uh, if the design itself, as they say, is an intentional solution, this definition, this statement would establish that design is the artifact itself. So if I say that design is an intentional solution, I'm not uh, describing what is design, but I'm describing what are the products coming from design, the artifacts from design. So the solutions, the products we may have, the posters we may have, or any kind of other objects we can come up from design. So this is my first perspective. I'm here not, they are not defining design, but they are defining design artifacts. The second problem I find in this statement is with is when they say creation of plans. If creation of plans gives this intention a solution they said before, then the statement con co contested here would place in equivalence what is design and to do design. So here we find another problem. In the first uh, in the first topic, I said, uh, there was a misunderstanding between design and design artifacts. And when we come to the second part of this statement, we have a misunderstanding about design and to do design, the action to do something, which once again does not bring me to define design itself. So... Here we have, here we start uh, with a snowball, a big snowball that we are misunderstanding what is design with what is to do design, the results from design, and this is not going to lead us anywhere. But from a specific point of view from semiotics, we can find one more question which is the one that makes me most worried. They say that the, 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 in the last part of this definition, they talk about sensible people or reasonable person or something like that. And for me, this proposition does not contemplate all the scopes of possible interpretations about design about to do design and the possible design artifacts because and here that's why i say it comes from a very specific semiotics point of view they are not comprehending here different states of understanding they are only uh i'm not getting too deep in a semiotics perspective, but when we take a look on Persian phenomenology, Persian semiotics, we are going to see there are three different categories of perception coming from other 12 categories proposed by Kant 
years and years before. And these categories, they are not there only because Kant or Peirce were two different philosophers trying to make the world more hard to understand or more hard to talk about. They are here to help us to understand how different people deal with different languages all the time. So they are here closer to a very symbolic kind of understanding. So they are very related to thirdness and they are excluding different kind of perceptions when we have more emphasis on firstness, for example, or secondness, maybe because people take a look or get in contact with some projects from design, uh, they will not always be so symbolic perceiving something, but they might be with emphasis in other categories. So they are excluding different meanings that can come from different perspectives on design artifacts. Once again, this is not to say that Parsons and Monteiro is that they are incorrect or that this statement or that this definition is wrong. It's not that, it's very on the contrary. This definition might open different possibilities for theoretical and philosophical deepening uh, when we are trying to say what is design. Once again, uh, I, I'm just making this introduction because for me, it's important before talking about design education and some results we are having on how we are teaching design, uh, it's very important to, to give you what's our point of view in our institution on what is design. As I said before, I'm going to talk about my perspective and my perspective comes from the first design institution in Portugal. Um, I think today we have a very different uh, approach to what is design uh, and this reflects how we teach design. That's why it's so important for me to, to try to, to, to start not defining design, but show you the, 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 the approach we have for design. But we are going to get there. So in our perspective, what is design? Oh, I think, okay. Um, some years ago, me and other colleagues tried to start um, looking to this definition I gave you, and we tried to, 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 to task the problems we had with that. But we saw we were getting even worse than those guys. So if I told you that that definition was very complicated, we were complicating this much more with a lot of blah, blah, blahs and not getting to the point. And this was when I stopped everything and said, guys, we must be clear. So what? is design. Let's try to, to, to define this, at least for our institution, in a simple sentence. And uh, after a, a very long process, we come with uh, a very direct sense of what is design. I'm not saying that this is the final truth of the world, but this is what we've been working with for the last five years here in our university. So well, what is design for us? Design is a language that requires processes. Uh, what does it mean? Because of course it's very ethereal also. You cannot use this the this sentence to tell your parents or your grandparents when they ask you what is design and you are going to tell them oh design is language and they are going to keep thinking okay so and then what we're going to do is it a good time to talk 
I'm sorry. I I think I think someone asked something. I didn't I didn't hear very Rodrigo well. Can, no, Rodrigo, continue. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. So, uh, what's our idea? Is to understand that design. Uh, it, this is a very uh, semiotic perspective on what is design. Design is language. What we do as designers is all the time uh, use language to produce something. And here we are talking about very different uh, kinds of design. We can talk about graphic design, project design, interior design, fashion design. We are using language. And all those languages, they require processes. These processes is the to-do design. So when I like when I use a process of graphic design, what I'm doing is to come to my cognition as a designer, to come to my um, to my repertoire as a designer, to look all the languages I have to try to translate something. What we are doing as designers is to translate something to the world, to a target audience sometimes. And when I say translate, I'm not talking about only verbal language because it's very easy to, to think about translation in verbal language, like, oh, okay, I'm translating something from Portuguese to English, from English to French or something. But no, we are doing what we call a semiotic translation or intersemiotic translation. Uh, which means that we are given different perspectives from different kinds of perception. So sometimes we, as designers, we are using sound references to make physical projects. We are using like uh, tactile perception to translate into graphics. So we are all the time translating different languages to different languages. That's why this is uh, our work. When people ask what you do as a designer, what I always say is I translate different perceptions into different results so it will be materialized in different realities for different people. That's why we say that design is language. Our, uh, our work is to, to understand language. And when I say language, once again, I'm not into only verbal language. I'm talking about like tactile language, olfactory language, visual language, all possibilities of language. We are working with this all the time as designers. So this is what we do. And here it comes a very specific approach we have. Um, when design is seen as language, it opens the possibility to understand how it may be transdisciplinary usage. And this comes to the main topic of this speech I'm giving you today, because this is how we look to design in our university and how we teach design and how we take design education. Because um, how we can teach something so ethereal? And my answer to that is always, we don't. Because let's think about how we learn language. How do we learn language? It's not in the university. It's not in the schools. We learn language living language. Let's get back to some examples. Like when we say about verbal language, each one of us learn it somehow, a verbal language, you know, like... Uh, I grew up speaking Portuguese. You guys 
might grow up speaking English or I don't know how how many people we have and from where those people come like we had Salvatore Zingali uh, who work who, who grew up speaking Italian so we learn it that language and this happens with everything we can think about like we learn to look to things and to give meaning to things we learn how to give a meaning to some kind of touch to some kind to some kind of smell and this is not something you are going to learn in the university it's not any of your professors who is going to teach you how to perceive the world how to acquire language what we can do is to teach you how to translate the languages you learn into different artifacts. So what we really teach is not design. What we teach is how to use your repertoire to do design. And you might, might be asking yourselves, okay, so, how do I learn languages? How do I learn design itself? L my answer is living. And this is this is where we have the most fundamental rule for those who want to be designers. As I said, we learn language living language and that's why we must go to the world and live as many languages as we can we sometimes take our lives like very poorly trying to look for our mirrors you know we are always looking to be friends or to be close to people who has the same beliefs as we do, who has the same truths as we do, who thinks just as we do. And what we are doing when we are living with those mirrors, with those people that has the same beliefs as us, is we are avoiding to learn new languages. We are avoiding to learn design. We are avoiding to grow our repertoires. So this is what I always tell my students in our first class. The first rule for you to be designer or if you want to improve your profession and, profession and be a better design is to live. But to live with other existences, to live with people who is going to question what is right and what's wrong, what's true for what's a lie or anything like that. Go and live with the more different people in the world you, you can have because it's from that people that you are gonna learn new languages, that you are gonna learn new possibilities and this is how you are going to grow your repertoire this is how you really are going to acquire different languages to translate this in different artifacts and really be part of a social meaning in other people's lives when we look to a designer from this per this perspective we can see the social power we are having in our hands because languages are the very specific things that creates what we call reality. Going back to Persian semiotics once again, uh, we must understand that in the classification of sciences that first did, we do not stop in semiotics. What comes next is metaphysics. So what he is, he is proposing is that we are not stopping on how we learn language. We 
are going further to understand how language creates realities, how language are going to affect other people's lives. And this is what you are doing as a, de as a designer. Just think about like, if you are a graphic designer and you are working with advertising, you are showing people some realities they can participate in. And this shows the social power we have. We, if we look some years ago, like in the 80s or the 90s, look how designers made people believe, like women believe if they were not skinny enough, they were not beautiful. If they were not blonde, they were not beautiful. If they were not blue eyes, they were not beautiful. And look how this affected a lot of women in the world, all around the world on how they look to themselves. So when we look to a designer as uh, I used to say a photoshopper, we are not looking to, to a designer as the social actor the designer is. So, and this is up to you, new students, new designers, to understand what are the realities you are going to create you know do we want to keep the world as it is like making people believe they are not beautiful enough they are not good enough or something like this or do you want to be a designer who are going to understand language understand different existences different resistances and change the world change the realities we are living in this is up to you you know uh i'm old already i'm an old designer and my colleagues are also old designers so you are the next generation you are the next designers and it's up to you to decide in which world you want to live in what is the reality you can you you want to create and uh, coming back to your grandparents, uh, I think some of you must have heard something like, uh, okay, uh, so you are becoming a designer. So why didn't you decide to become like a medical doctor or something? And my students never knew how to answer this question. And I tell them how to answer this question. Uh, of course, I'm not telling you that medical doctors, they are not uh, important. They are very important, but they care. They take care of our bodies. OK, if your body is sick, if you I don't know, if you break something or if you have a cut or a bacteria or something, they are going to deal with that. But they are only taking care of your bodies and not of your existence, not your humanity. Design does that because we are creating realities. So if in one hand, doctors are taking care of our bodies, we need much more to live. And we need, to, we need design to be humans, to understand ourselves in the world to understand what is reality, because to do design is to create realities. And that's how we uh, started this kind of teaching we've been doing in our university. Uh, we are very clear to our students that what they are going to learn inside the university is to do design to translate language, but to learn design, they must live the most different realities they can live. So that's why we give so much importance for our students to go to parties, to travel around the world. This is part of their curriculum. This is part of what we do because we cannot teach how to live. We cannot teach language. We cannot grow the repertoire of people inside the walls of the university. 
So they must go to the world. They must give themselves to the world, learn as many languages as they can. And once again, I'm not talking about verbal language, okay? I'm talking about experience. I'm talking about touching things, tasting things, smelling things, saying things. This is acquire language. And this is the first step. So this is what we tell people, go to the world. And then you come back and we can help you to translate everything you acquired into design artifacts. But if you have a very poor repertoire, there's not much we can do. And this kind of approach to how we teach design in our university uh, comes, of course, from a very extensive literature reveal on teaching design. As you can see here, we have many different authors. Some of you, uh, some of them have heard about some of them at least, but of course they are important. They are, we have here people like Cross, like Norman, like Takara, very important people on the design field. And we come from their perspective to try to, to understand how we can act inside our university. Some years ago, uh, we started publishing our work on how we approach design how we approach design education. It comes with now a series of different, uh, different works we have published. The first one is called Three Pillars for a Trajectory in Design Education. Uh, and after that, we came with other publications as Sima just told you in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, if you want those those papers, if you want those texts, just to take a look later, I can send to you. I know Sima said to 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 buy the 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 book and everything. Don't tell Sima I told you that. Don't buy it. Just get in contact with me and I can send you. Okay, but don't tell anyone. So. The first thing is we developed it for coming from a Persian semiotics point of view, we created the, the three pillars to design education inside, inside our institution, which comes the first one with the basic skills, then knowledge through practice and active reflection, and the third one, transdisciplinarity and entrepreneurial skills. The first one, the basic skills, is related to what I told you. to the start applying this knowledge in different fields, in different knowledge, like that's why we talk about transdisciplinarity and how, of course, which is something important, we can be professionals. We can earn money doing design because at the end we need money to, to live. So how we can really work as designer as designers, but not only work as designers, but 
how we can produce a new world, how we can impact the world uh, being a designer. Uh, as I said, this perspective, these three pillars in design education comes basically from Persian semiotics. So oh, I'll just go back. When you see here, we have in yellow the first topic, in green the second, and orange the third one. And this path we have comes inside the, the classification of sciences first gave us. So everything related to the theoretical sciences, science of discovery, philosophy, phenomenology, normative sciences, until we get to semiotics. This is where we are learning language. So this is the phase of experience we are having to grow our repertoires, to learn new possibilities, to learn new languages. And then we come to the methodeutic to understand how we can apply this repertoire, how we can apply the knowledge to go to the last stage, which is metaphysics, how this knowledge we are applying through design is going to create different realities. That's why we, uh, I told you before, we must not stop on semiotics. If we stop on semiotics, we are only stopping in the, the top of the iceberg, you know? If we are looking to design as a creator of realities, we must to go to the theory of realities, which is metaphysics in this approach, in approach we are working with. It's important also to understand that we have so many different approaches on semiotics all around the world, from different philosophers, from different countries, here, specifically, we are using Persian semiotics or Persian philosophy, Persian point of view. I know we can translate this to many different philosophers or other semioticians are going to take a look on this from a very different perspective. This is only what we do, and I'm not saying that what we do is right or the best thing. I'm only saying that it's working for us at this moment, okay? Um, from that, we came with four different kinds of design education, which also comes from a project-based learning perspective. We have here this four models. So the first model is, is what we call intrinsic project-based learning. The second one is the co-creative project-based learning. The third one is cross-project-based learning. And the fourth one is the title of this presentation, Intermote Trends Cross-Project-Based Learning. What does it mean? In the first one, when we say we have intrinsic project semesters one of this discipline is the main one and all other four disciplines they are going to give new knowledge to apply to this main one this main discipline is what we call project discipline so this is the design discipline coming with different perspectives from other areas inside design to create new projects the the project which was uh, uh, which was showed before my presentation the the games and everything is very related to to one of the projects we have in, with our students for the first years in global design where they also develop some games in this kind of project this kind of situation the intrinsic project based learning. But going next, we try to make it more difficult. We do not only have 
one project discipline with all with, with four other disciplines inside design, but we have another discipline mandatorily coming from outside of design. So here we use a discipline from the other bachelors we have, like in technologies or in marketing or in communication. It's not very far from design, but is outside the science area. So this is what we call co-creative project-based learning. And then we try to make it more hard. It's not only one discipline coming from other area, but one entire course coming from other area. So we have the cross project based learning. We work at the same situation, like we have a man discipline and four others giving information to this man discipline. But at this time, we have two courses working together and the two man disciplines, they are connected to each other. So it's like we have, for example, uh, a bachelor in design working with a bachelor in creative technologies. And both students from both courses, they are going to task a problem and try to solve this problem together from different areas, but it's still not so different areas completely outside from design world. Design world. This leads us to the most uh, complex one, the fourth one, in which we still have two courses working together, but we have a lot of different researchers, institutions, and other universities working with us. So we have here uh, really what we call transdisciplinarity. When we test social problems, when we test health problem, uh, environmental problem, and so on. So it comes from the most simple to the most complex one. I will show you some results we've been having. Uh, of course, uh, you can see more. I just prepared some more um, works for you to, to take a look. You can use the, the, the QR codes. But this is uh, the, the most easy one. So we are talking about uh, intrinsic project-based learning. This is our first year student, first year students who is always working inside design world. And they always have what we call a client to work with. Uh, this example you are seeing, they were working with a uh, tattoo studio here in Lisbon, but we have other partners such as Vans, Vogue Portugal, um, and other important brands in which all the students are going to use all the disciplines they are, they are doing in one semester to solve the problem of a real client in a real environment. So this is all implemented later. They are really working for brands with design, uh, publishing their work and helping the, 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 the system we have with different clients uh, inside our university. Then we come to a second one. This is very related to to, to the first one in which we have uh, another discipline from another communication course in which some students from that other course comes to work with our designers to develop some video casts and podcasts and everything uh, related to communication and how they can deal with designers to improve their work and our designers works. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, the cross project based learning in which we start working with uh, more different areas. In this example, you uh, we can see 
something that a project that is very important for me. We were awarded uh, with this project so many times and uh, it's something very important for me as a professor and to to participate in this project. This is a project we created uh, with two different courses from two different areas inside our university where we were trying to to improve transgender women lives. So we worked with the makeup industry. We were collecting some material with this makeup industry, these makeup factories. Then we created some makeup kits and gave to transgender women to start working as, uh, as uh, makeup artists so they uh, could come out, come out from the marginalization. I don't know how is the situation of transgender people in India, but here in Portugal, uh, transgender people are still very marginalized. Sometimes they do not uh, have access to work uh, in most part of the, 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 the companies we have. Uh, it's a real problem. And this is the it's way- the same in India, Rodrigo. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sima. So this was our- uh, it's our, it was our try to give new possibilities to transgender women so they would start working by themselves uh, as makeup artists and of course they were start they, they would start using also the products from this makeup industry and we were going to create a circle to to try to improve the companies and also uh, most importantly, transgender people lives. And later we have the, the man one and the most important one we have. And this is like my kid, you know, I don't have kids, but <laughs> this is my kid. Uh, from the last perspective, from the, the intermote trans cross project based learning, uh, which was created by me, we created uh, a specific department in our university called PUSH. And PUSH is uh, one department inside the university to bring all together all the, the, the courses we have inside the university to work with other universities from other areas, is specific in three main pillars, health, social and environmental so you can see up there like give a health push give a social push give an environmental push and from this perspective we've been working with different people as you can see in different projects we have here uh we've been working with uh children who was born with hiv and is living with hiv uh, we created some, some applications to try to make their lives more comfortable when they have to go to hospital and everything. We also have done this with children with living, uh, who is living with diabetes. Uh, we created some, uh, some apps to improve how they, they can measure sugar in their bloods. Uh, this specific project here with these strange faces is, uh, is for me the most important one because this is my, uh, my PhD project, which is called uh, Avatar Therapy, in which we were creating um, a kind of, uh, we were, actually working with a university in London uh, with a doctor called Julian Leff. And Julian Leff created um, a method to treat schizophrenia that is called avatar therapy, in which his idea was to create three-dimensional digital avatars to materialize the, the entities 
that was hallucinated by their patients. And we were helping how to materialize these avatars. And from here, we have a lot of different perspectives with social institutions, with health institutions, environmental institutions. And this is my, my call to invite you all to, to visit our university. If you, some of you are like thinking, oh, okay, this might be interesting. I will be very glad to, to, to have you here, to go through the university with you, to, so, to show some uh, Portuguese culture, just take care with the food, okay? Since I came to live here, I gained 30 kilos. It's not easy, but I will be very glad to have you all here. Uh, just as final considerations from this work we've been doing, as I said, this is not the final truth. This is not what is going to work for everyone, everywhere, in every institution. But the results we are having is we can now integrate multiple, di multiple disciplines inside design education. We are encouraging more collaborations between uh, social institutions, health institutions, and our university. We are fostering creativity and innovation in different fields of science. We are incorporating real-world projects because all projects we work is always real-world projects. We do not work with something that a professor come up because he because they think is something nice to do. Uh, and we are providing uh, more diverse learning opportunities to our students since we understand that we must put them in the world to live the world. And then when they come back with a more growth uh, repertoire, we can start trying to do design. But most importantly, we are trying to create a more real, equal, dignified, alternate, justifiable, empathetic, perfect, what people call world, but I prefer to call shared reality. Because as I said, for me to do design is to create reality. And it's up to us to understand what kind of realities we are creating and we want to live in. And that's all for today. Thank you all very much. I hope it was not boring. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Rodrigo. That is absolutely fascinating to see how you have uh, created a curriculum around real design in Portugal. Um, just a, a question. Is, it, is, is this sort of uh, in your university or you, I remember you presenting in Greece about uh, different uh, design pedagogies across universities yeah. and uh, there was some comparative study that you had done. Exactly. No, this is what we are doing in our university. Okay. Specifically in our university. Uh, of course, to get to this model, we were uh, studying other universities here in Portugal and other important institutions all around the world, like in the US, in Germany, in the UK, in India, and everywhere. But this is our specific model. Okay. Salim, I think this is your uh, forte, so. Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, it's been incredible to hear you speak to your experiences um, um, in Portugal uh, at your specific uh, university. And in fact, I was going to some of the points that you mentioned at the end, um, which were linked to uh, multiple disciplinarity, uh, you know, collaboration, uh, fostering creativity and innovation and incorporating real world projects. It's something very similar that we are hoping to achieve at CEPT as well. So I think that it's uh, amazing to see this kind of sync, um, and I'm happy to hear you, you know, share this. I also enjoyed the three pillars that you spoke about, um, you know, the basic skills, the knowledge theory, practice, and reflection. Um, so that's an uh, entrepreneurship as well. So um, I also uh, really enjoyed the overall graphic language of your presentation. Um, you know, the chalkboard uh, background and the crisp text and 
uh, the articulation of uh, text and some scribbles to add some um, layers of um, perhaps uh, you know humor into into the way you speak and you know achieve your um, uh, stated intent. But uh, great, great to you know um, see this, uh, and I hope to meet you sometime, whether in India or in Portugal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sonia. Yeah, so, so Rodrigo, I think we should, Salim, it would be interesting to have more conversations with Rodrigo, uh, you know, over time uh, to discuss and share pedagogical, um, you know, experiences. Um, sure. Yeah, would you be open to that, Rodrigo? I'm completely open. Anytime you want, we can, we can talk about this. This is my life as i said i don't have kids so this is my kid this is the kid i i'm dealing with for some years and i will uh, i will be very pleased to 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 talk about this anytime you want and if you want to come to portugal you'll be very welcome <laughs> yes uh this cross disciplinarity that you talk about the last model Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you? Uh, I mean, it must be very difficult. It must be the most complex of of the yeah. three, right? Yeah. Um, so, so what kind of disciplines do come that, that come together? Okay, uh, that'll be very interesting to know. Yeah, this is this is the very complex one. Uh, inside our pedagogical practice in, in the university, we have uh, a project called Synergies, which is also published. I can send you uh, the, the papers later. And this is my work in, in this Synergy project to target. Uh, first of all, we do not have closed uh, models. So we go to the world and find some problems. Like for example, when we work in with a hospital here in Portugal with kids living with HIV or diabetes, first of all, I found the problem. And then it's my job to come back and look to the problem, look to all disciplines we have in different courses and start understanding, okay, I can use this discipline to, to do this. I can do that, that discipline can do that. So it's like I create like a new semester with a new course from different disciplines, from different courses to target one specific problem. So we never have like twice the, the, the same project uh, with the same disciplines. Because first of all, I look to the problem, then I collect all disciplines from different courses I can use to target that problem. Well, that's interesting. So that's it's not very, easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy because yes. I'll also uh, add, um, Seema, I don't know if I can share my screen. Yeah. But um, there's something which I came across and come back to sharing it right now on the screen. But uh, in, in in sync with what um, you know, Rigo is saying in yeah. terms of uh, the various disciplinarities and how they come together to impact projects, uh, mm -hmm. and I also felt that this kind of uh, shares in some way um, the differences uh, as much as uh, the, the focus areas of every type of disciplinarity. So there's intra going all the way to trans, and what it really means in terms of how uh, these various uh, fields interact and mingle. Um, yeah. I thought it would be uh, interesting to share yeah, yeah. Um, at the end. And one more thing I enjoyed, uh, Rodrigo, was your, your focus on social, social yeah. health and environmental, because that's something yeah. we seem to have missed. And I mean, India, there has been a very strong background through the history of design in the country, um, focusing on social health and environment. Um, I'm sure uh, because of the challenges we face um, as a developing country, or uh, challenges we have faced, um, you know, and continue to face, um, do do actually uh, stem from these various um, areas. So uh, yes, I mean happy to kind of also your your um, interest in these three areas. So uh, thank you for that as well. Yeah, uh, in this diagram uh, you are showing, it's very interesting. When we go to the the final one, the transdisciplinary, it shows really what we we are trying to do. You know, you have 
a lot of different disciplines inside the, the, the different courses we have, but we also have the outside points, which is the, the institutions working with us, like social institutions, hospitals, other research centers, and so on. This is a very interesting diagram. Yeah. Anybody, uh, uh, Salvatore, would you like to uh, add? Uh, Salvatore, are you there? Who there? Yeah. Who yeah. there? Yeah. No, I was there. Like I was to... listening no, to this, but. Uh... One biggest problem is to implement it, you know, get faculty to really understand how this works. I don't know how that is solved because everybody has his own fascination about what areas he wants to be in. So how do you solve that problem? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. So, faculty has their own interest, right? Oh, yeah. 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 And they may not match with the idea of transdisciplinary projects. So how do you handle this? Actually, uh, I, I don't know if it is uh, like, uh, if I'm lucky <laughs> or, or something, but they are very open to that. They are really, really open to that. Um, I remember uh, five years ago, um, I was working in different universities all around the world. Basically, I was like, every half years in a different country and teaching design from a different perspective in a different place. When I was invited to, when this university here in Portugal uh, knew me for the first time uh, in a conference, I was, uh, uh, I was given a speech and they invited me to, to come here and to create roots in Portugal to, to establish this project. They were not really uh, aware uh, of what they wanted, but they knew where they wanted to be and how they wanted to be seen. So I had like a white card when I came here to start developing what I wanted. They, they just knew they wanted to change, they wanted to improve, and they wanted to, to, to have a more impactful uh, design education in Portugal, since they are the first university uh, of design in Portugal. So I think I was lucky to, to, to have this white card and to be able to do uh, all of this. Of course, during the process, we are always finding some barriers. We are finding some problems. We are finding some people who sometimes has a more traditional point of view, but it's not being so hard to apply this as it has been in other times of my life in other universities. You know, I like your, I like the idea that you first identify the problem. Mm -hmm. And then you get everyone around it. Yeah. You know, so in, for instance, you have AIDS or you have transgender or you have, you know, some other social issue and then you get different people. So I think that probably is, uh, Uday, I don't know if that answers Uday's question is, uh, you know, so instead of, so, so you know, the, 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 the onus is, I mean, you take the lead, right, Rodrigo? Yes, yes. Uh... Sometimes it's not easy because I take the lead of all the projects. And like in one semester, we may have like 70 projects happening at the same time. Right. And this is very complicated. Just like today, for example, uh, we have a project going on, uh, which is a project that it's it became something traditional to the university. We, we call this creative challenge so we have one week in which all our students from all our courses are trying to target one same problem always given by uh, a very known portuguese brand 
Uh, we are working now with a brand for uh, uh, for food for children uh, this year. So my students, I, I think you can hear my WhatsApp playing all the uh, ringing all the time because my students are present this now to the client. So it's this, it, it's not easy. There are a lot of different projects going on at the same time. And we must remember that it's not also easy to, to work with so many different professors from different fields. Sometimes we have some professors like who is more traditional, who doesn't work to collaborate. And this is not all flowers, you know. Uh, when, we, when we look to the, the end, when we look to the results, it's kind of kind of beautiful but my everyday life it's not so easy <laughs> yeah I can imagine um, anybody who would like to uh, comment or in the audience should be let Rodrigo go because his WhatsApp is constantly uh, buzzing and he needs to answer his uh, students. <laughs> I'm ready to go to the university because uh, I'm the jury of the final uh, of the final Ouch. challenge. But and thank you so much, Rodrigo, for having spared uh, your time today. I, it was wonderful. I thank you once again for inviting me and congratulate you for organizing everything. And when you want to talk about this again, you, Salim, uh, you died. When you want to talk about this, we can talk about this sure. anytime. If Absolutely. If you want to, to, to schedule like a, a video call, we can do that. Or yes. If you want to come That'll to be wonderful. Together. That'll be wonderful, Rodrigo. Thank you so much for the offer. Thank you. And uh, yes, thank you. And I think I, I wouldn't want to keep you. You you really have a whole day ahead of you. So um you know, we shall excuse. Please carry on, Rodrigo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank you much. See you guys. Thank you. See you guys. See you. See you. Uh, you. Bye -bye. Seema, you, you, may, you may want to uh, state that at three thirty there was one presentation by uh, uh, so going to start, which has now been uh, cancelled. Yeah, it's course. been yeah, it's been cancelled because the person is not well. Um, uh, both of them, in fact. So I just want. To to inform everybody that uh, uh, since looking at the, the, the interest uh, uh, in, in the topics, I will uh, try and get a third day uh, sometime in June um, so that uh, we can have all of them who couldn't attend uh, due to various uh, uh, you know, issues at this time, we can re-gather uh, uh, in June and have another day full of uh, you know, wonderful presentations. Is that, does that sound uh, okay with all of you? I think we would have finished your vacations. Uh, I think you would be ready for another round of intellectual um, and uh, interesting conversations. Is that fine? Uh, can can you know, when yeah, see, I just, I, yeah? That, 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 that should be good. Yeah, um, so I shall then try and organize that for June. Uh, and um, yeah, so we, I, I mean, I, I'd like to thank everybody, Salvatore, Uday, Rodrigo, Farooq today for such a fabulous day. Um, I, I think I couldn't have asked for anything better. And thank you, audience, uh, all of you for being there and for encouraging the SEPT uh, Faculty of Design. Thank you, Salim. I mean, your presence is the, the, the ultimate. So um, goodbye and uh, see you soon. See you in June. So we're going to keep this going uh, as much as we can, because I think there is a need, Salim, to have these kind of uh, ongoing conversations between different disciplines. And we, we might have an anthropologist next time on board. So, you know. No, I think that... Um... You know the way design is panning out today as a practice. Uh, it does in, involve all these uh, various disciplinarities, as we've spoken about. And yeah, um, I think more and more we need to get a sense of how these act and what reactions they uh, bring in into the world of design. So yeah. um, we we will continue these these conferences or these talks, and we'll see how to uh, frame them perhaps uh, in ways where uh, we 
uh, also communicate uh, these well in advance. What typically happens is that because they're in the middle of the day, um, you know, people who are working and people who are in university and yeah, uh, they, yeah. they have we'll, difficulty we'll, in attending. Um, yeah, we'll plan it better. But uh, it's also <laughs> the fact that we are working across the world. There's yeah, somebody that's, in that's, the US, that's somebody the issue. in Europe. Yeah, yeah time it's, zones. It's, uh, so I think what might be uh, perhaps useful is to find a way to record all this and uh, upload it somewhere. Where yeah, this that's as a, uh, and I know that you're planning a book uh, around these lines as yeah. well. Yeah. So that will, if we can have a timeline for that book, uh, it'll be interesting to put all these various um, uh, yeah. talks and essays um, and sure. papers into a into a publication and let's set to publish it. Sure. So uh, that's uh, also on the cards. And uh, yeah. I think we, we we should wait, Seema, at least two of us, because I think the next uh, was a, the next announcement was a three uh, uh, okay. uh, thirty to four thirty one, which was velvet. But uh, in case somebody joins at 3.30 for her talk, ah, we can, okay. uh, you know, okay. we can just share that it's, it's okay. been uh, okay. cancelled for medical uh, reasons. Sure. Uh, anybody, would you, would you, if any of your audience uh, would you like to share your experiences of the today and if the previous uh, day, it would be wonderful because... I, we... I, I think Rohit uh, is here. Rohit was uh, one of my faculty at Academy of Architecture. Uh, Rohit okay. Chingre. Um, I don't know if he's there. I, I can't be he's sure. Here, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm uh, here. But, I'm here. <laughs> uh, you know, he's a friend now and, you know, we, uh, we do interact occasionally. Uh, Rohit, I think I, today I, you missed a few earlier sessions. Yes, um, yes. They were I think we had a final year jury last night. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Today, so we, uh, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll try to see how we can share these recordings because, uh, you know, in sure. Farooq's uh, uh, Talk was incredible. Uh, Uday's as well. Uday's unfortunately to break up because uh, of time lag, and then then we had um, uh, you know other talks as well. But uh, Salvatore, we, Salvatore, yeah, was, Salvatore yeah, and yes. all, 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 all. So I think that it'll be good to put these together in some in some format and upload them. But um, yeah. Should be, yeah, but uh, anybody who has any suggestions on, uh, uh, see, one of the, the biggest issues that we that I had was to get the time zones, uh, you know, uh, and um, unfortunately, like you know, uh, um, Rodrigo couldn't join. It it was early morning for him, and uh, you know, so we couldn't have all the speakers. You know, so time. one thing I want to just add over there, Seema, is that it will be very difficult. So why we Imagine in the post-COVID world that uh, online conferences are easy because we've all been through months and months of you know online uh, interaction. Uh, what is has changed, however, is that um, during the COVID phase, everybody was forced to be at home. Uh, yeah. Right? Uh, they weren't doing anything else. They were perhaps not not even um, you know employed uh, in a physical way with the organization. Um, mm -hmm. So they the, the opportunities to uh, interact from a specific location were um, definite. Now, with everything opened up and everyone, like for example, uh, you know, Rodrigo had to run to university uh, or uh, Rohit had to kind of, you know, had a jury. With now these multiple um, professional uh, roles coming into play, while the interest of, have, while the intent of having a, uh, an online uh, conference, um, you know, uh, is, is there, the ability to get multiple people together at the time when they aren't doing anything else, apart from the time zones, um, there's a matter of, you know, the daily routines as well and schedules of various people. Uh, so that becomes challenging, but we will uh, find a way around all this. Um, yes. <laughs> but it, I yeah, think but it was amazing. Uh, it was an amazing start uh, uh, yeah. to, uh, to the various I mean, conferences I set. It's, it's just been such a privilege to have all, all the speakers. I mean, Today was absolutely power backed, and uh, you know, um, and, and and the fact is that you're getting perspectives, uh, from, yeah. and, and current perspectives from across the world. It's not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not that the recordings from you know ten years back. It's it's yeah. it's live uh, in some way in terms of live research, live uh, interactions, the queries that, that that come into play. There's thoughts that are shared, um, and the insights which are. Uh, based on uh, various, uh, of course, in this case, it's semiotics, uh, but they've also gone into design process today, especially, which is which is a, a complex um, yeah. arena. True. 
So it's yes. three, three twenty five. Yes, who, who's? I mean, yeah, we can. Everyone can, you know. Um, it ends. The, the conference ends, and thank you so much. Uh, and we'll and meet again, again. We'll meet again in June. Uh, once everybody's had their vacation, um, I will try and get a hold of the Tampere University gang, which is young, very young, very sprightly, very energetic, and the same communicate. They're communication designers, they're game designers, they're speculative design. I mean, they're just about. They're they're a very very nice lot. So I shall, uh, you know, sort of get them all for you uh, in June. So I promise and. Thank you all so much. Thank you.